Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Welcome once again to another adventurous journey across the mysterious and terror-filled terrain of the human imagination. The moving finger, the poet said, writes, and having writ, moves on. Not all your piety nor wit shall lure it back to cancel half a line, nor all your tears wash out a word of it. Well, we seek no quarrel with the great Omar, but the fact is that anything written can be rewritten, even erased. It's all merely a matter of knowing the right people. What do you need the money for? To bet with. It's immoral. It's a way to make a fortune. Besides, you can lose. Oh, oh, not me. I've heard people say that before on the way to the poorhouse. Jerry, listen. I know who's going to win the World Series. I know who's going to be elected president next year. I know what stocks are going up. You're crazy. Just let me have the money, Jerry. I'll double it, quadruple it. There's no limit to what we can win. I know everything that will happen in the next 21 years. We can be the richest people in the world, Jerry. We, we can own the world. Our mystery drama, Yesterday's Murder, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Mercedes McCambridge. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Admittedly, this is not the best of all possible worlds. But it's the only world we have at this point. And so there are times when we despair of the inequity and unfairness of so many things. But we should remember, there is justice. Even though it may not always look that way, there is justice. And justice moves at its own pace, manifests itself in its own way a way that is sometimes as obvious and dramatic as a bolt of lightning, sometimes as silent, as unobtrusive as the fall of a leaf. But either way, justice will have been done, finally, irrevocably, and for all eternity. But let us begin our story, or rather continue, for who knows when any story really begins. At Ramiletti's, which is, as you know, a very chic very exclusive watering place for the very wealthy. May I get you something, madam? Well, I'm expecting someone, so I'll just order a small... Why, it's Dottie. Dottie Malloy. Hello, Jane. Dottie, it can't be... It can't be you. Why not? Because you look so... Uh, so old. Oh, I, I, I didn't mean that. Well, I, I suppose I do look old. But you're just a year older than I am. You can't even be 40 yet. I'm two years younger than you are, Jane. And I was just 43 last week. I didn't recognize you at first. Have I changed that much in 20 years? No, no, I was just so busy looking at the necklace and the earrings and, and, and the rings. <laughs> the diamonds are all genuine. But if you got them, wear them. Well, to answer your question, you haven't changed. You look exactly the same. Same as you did when we were both working at Waterfield and Prentice. Actually, you look better. I don't suppose. Well, that is, I I guess you're not allowed to sit down and talk to me. No, I'm 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 very happy for you, Jane. Well, that's another thing. I can't say that I'm happy for you. Uh how is uh, well, Harold? Oh, yes, yes, Harold. He's fine. Still as handsome as ever? Handsomer. Huh? What's he doing now? Oh, you know what he's doing. Yeah, I suppose I do. Still selling men's suits at Westings. No, not at Westings, but at a place just like it. That's all he ever wanted to do. Is to wear smart clothes. I want to apologize to you, Dottie. What for? Oh, for the way I hated you. For taking Harold away from me. 
I couldn't take what you didn't have. I know. Actually, you did me a favor. Yes, I can see that I did. I would have been stuck with Harold, just as... Just as I am. Hmm. Well, this way I made three fantastic marriages, each one wealthier than the last. I'm glad for you. Oh, Daddy, I want to cry. Why? Because... Because I look at you and I remember how you how you used to be, how you sparkled. Well, that's life. No. No, it's not life. It's it's money. Or I should say not having money. Daddy, let me do something for you. What? When I just don't take what I'm about to say the wrong way, Daddy. Let me give you some money. No, 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 Jane. Money can't help me. I don't say. Nothing can help me. That's the only way to put it. And I'm serious, Jane. The only thing I can say is that I... I'm under a curse. Daddy, that's... It's true. And I deserve it. So... What's your order? Daddy? Is there any point in my saying that we should get together soon? No. No, Jane, you know as well as I do, there is no point in your saying it. Hey, you're late. Yeah, I had to work dinner. Oh, that's okay. I made myself a sandwich. You eat? I'm not hungry. Well, should you be... No, no, maybe later. Did anybody interesting come into the place today? No. Nobody. Well, you know, I kind of wish I worked in a place where you could meet celebrities. You don't meet them, Harold. You just wait on them. Well, it should give you something to talk about, wouldn't it? Hey, I'm glad I had a chance to see you before I left. Where are you going? Where am I? (laughs) You know, you haven't changed a single little bit in 20 years. You're still the greatest little kidder in the whole wide world. I forgot. It's Tuesday night. Yes, indeedy, Dottie. It's Tuesday night. And old handsome Harold goes bowling for 17 years, man and boy, through rain and sleet and snow and hail. Well, I think I'll go lie down. Oh, sure, honey. Why don't you do that? You you look tired. And good night, honey. Don't be too late. You know, you always say that. Good night. I'll see you. Huh? What the... Oh, now what did he do? Forget his key. Look at me. I must have fallen asleep on the couch. All right, all right. I'm coming, I'm coming. Honestly, Harold, the least you could do is take... Oh. Good evening. Did I waken you? Who are you? I'm Mr. Carpenter. And you are Mrs. Malloy. Yes, What do you want, Mr. Carpenter? I should say, what do you want, Mrs. Malloy? Well, you're the one who rang my bell. Yes, because you sent for me. I sent for you? I'm from Opportunity Incorporated. Opportunity Incorporated? Why don't I come in? Ah, Thank you. Uh, I have a copy of your letter here. My letter? You don't recognize it? Oh, you're the people who had that ad in the paper. Precisely, Mrs. Malloy. Well, what are you selling? Nothing. Well, let me put it this way. What will whatever you have to give away cost me? Nothing. Well, how do you stay in business? Whatever your business is. We're a uh, non-profit organization. Well, then I don't understand. A copy of our ad. See? Would you like an opportunity to change the course of your life? If so, write Opportunity Unlimited. You wrote, I'm here. You know what it's about? What's it about? A job? A a, a chance to go into a new business? I mean, What what do you want it to be? Well, it's too late to change the course of my life. It's never too late. Well, you don't understand. I think I do. You see, something happened a long time ago. Twenty-one years ago, to be exact. Yes, that's right, and I... I... And you think you're still being punished for it. Wait a minute. How do you know... I know everything. 
What do you mean, everything? Who are you? I told you. Mr. Carpenter, from Opportunity Unlimited. Now, on a certain evening, 21 years ago. What? Wait. Which evening? You know the evening. How can you ever forget it? You dream about it every night. You relive it in every night. I don't know what you're talking about. Sure you do. How would I be able to remember some evening? Let me refresh your memory. You were working for a brokerage house called Waterfield and Prentice. It was nine o'clock at night. The entire building was empty, deserted, except for... Well, except for you. What were you doing there at nine o'clock at night? What were you doing in Mr. Waterfield's private office? What were you doing taking money out of Mr. Waterfield's safe? Suddenly you turn ashy white with fear. You hear a door open, and it's... It's old Jerry, the night watchman. And he asks you the very same question. What are you doing at that safe, Dottie? Oh, Jerry... Oh, you scared me. Well, you see, uh, uh, Mr. Waterfield called me. And he asked, could I come down here and take this money out of the safe? And, uh... No, Daddy. It ain't so. He didn't ask you nothing of the sort. Oh, but I tell you, he... he, he... Besides, you ain't supposed to know the combination. How'd you find the combination, Dottie? Jerry, Jerry, listen. I know you were tempted, and, and I can understand that, Dottie. I need this money. It's not just for me. It's to help somebody. Jerry, I'm not supposed to know the combination. Nobody could ever trace this to me. I guess not. And it's only $20,000. What's $20,000 to old man Waterfield? He can afford to lose it. Look, Jerry, I'll I'll give you some of it. $5,000. No, Dottie. I'm taking this money. You can't stop me. I'll have to report you, Dottie. I'll deny it. It's your word against mine. Enough people around here think you're getting senile anyhow. Now, Jerry, get out of my way. I'll have to stop you, Dottie. It's my duty. You're an old man, and I don't want to hurt you. Now, let go of me. Put the black money oh, back. Get your hands off me. Put it back, Dottie. No. Please. <laughs> Dottie, put it. Put it. Jerry. Jerry, I didn't touch you. It, 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 it's my heart. I have pills in my shirt pocket. Give me a... Give me a... Jerry, don't. Uh, Jerry, please don't die. I'll put the money back, but please, Jerry. Oh. But he did die. And you didn't put the money back. What do you want? Did you come here to blackmail me? Tell me. Were you sincere? Would you really put the money back if you had another chance? Yes. It would have saved Jerry's life if I'd done it when he asked me. That's why I am here. To give you that opportunity to put the money back. Put the money back? That money's been gone for years, $20,000. And I never had so much as a penny's worth of enjoyment out of it. How would you like the chance to put the money back? How can I put it back? I don't have it. Would you like to have the chance to put it back while he was still asking you to do it? What are you saying? What are you saying? can't be very much doubt about what he's saying. He's certainly saying it clearly enough. But can it be done? Even so, you certainly have to admit, it isn't the kind of offer you get every day. Should she take him up on it? Would you? I shall return shortly with Act Two. They say you can't go back again. Once you leave a certain time and a certain place, it's gone forever. On the face of it, it sounds like an extremely sound rule. However, as everyone knows, every rule has its exceptions. 
And this is what a Mr. Carpenter seems to be discussing with Dotty Malloy. What I'm saying, Mrs. Malloy, and I thought I was saying it clearly, is would you like to have the chance to put the money back when old Jerry asked you to? But that's impossible. I didn't ask you if it was possible. I asked you if you would like to have the chance to do it. I know I'm not asleep. I'm not dreaming all this. No, you're wide awake. Well, your answer... Twenty thousand dollars. That was a fortune. A fortune. I thought it would change my whole life. And it did. It made me an old woman long before my time. I know. I had to hide that money. I had to lie about every nickel of it. When Harold needed five thousand dollars to go into business, I made up a story of an aunt who died and left me them. Now, what's the difference? He went bankrupt anyhow. I bought stocks that dropped out of sight. I bet on horses. Some of them never even finished. That's right. It was as if there was a curse on that money. Well, you seem to know everything, was there? Well, let's say you should never have taken it. Would my life have been different? Yes. Tell me how. I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? Without that murder on your conscience. Don't call it murder. It was... It was... What was it? <laughs> you would have looked at things differently. Had a different attitude. Unless, of course... Unless what? Unless you happen to be a thief in your heart. In <laughs> which case, one way or another, you'd wind up just about the way you are now. A failure filled with remorse. I'm not a thief. I wasn't... <laughs> I never stole anything in my life until... The... Well, you probably never had the opportunity. Don't say that. I have to say that because there's no point in giving you a chance to make amends if... If? If in the end you do the same thing all over again. Do you think I'd... Oh, Lord. To get one night's sleep. To lose the sight of that old man's face, I would give my soul. You don't have to give anything. Money. Once I thought it was everything. Oh, look what it did to me. I hate it. I don't want it. Please, give me that chance. Give me that chance. Oh, listen to me. Listen to what I'm saying. I must be crazy. Somehow, a stranger... It comes into my house, and somehow he found out a secret about me. And for some reason which I can't understand, he chooses to amuse himself. I admit this is shocking to you. But there's one way to prove that I'm serious and you're not crazy. Huh. Go back. Go back? 21 years? Yes. I'm afraid. Afraid? Afraid to be young again? Afraid to have another chance, another lifetime? How would a thing like this work? It's very simple. You agree to go back for the express purpose of rectifying an unfortunate action that you committed under stress. You are given an opportunity to do it. And then do I come back here to the present? That's... That's difficult to say. You're going back there. Here won't happen for another 21 years. So, where here is going to be will depend on the new life you'd make for yourself. Oh. Well, what have I got to lose? My wonderful job... This beautiful apartment, my intelligent husband. <laughs> I'm ready. A word of caution. If you don't put that money back... Oh, how can you even bring that up? That's what I'm going back there for, isn't it? Well, I would just like to warn... You don't have to warn me about anything. You just sold me. Now, how do we do it? Oh, listen to me. I must be crazy. I really believe what you're saying. Now that you understand... Come with me. Where? For a walk. At this hour? When we get downstairs, it won't be this hour. But I'm not dressed to go walking. 
You're not dressed for 21 years ago either. But don't worry. It will all adjust itself. Come. But I... Well? Harold, he'll come back. He'll worry. No, he won't. Once you walk out of here, this place no longer exists. I'm scared. That's perfectly natural. Don't be afraid. Come. Here, hold my hand. Now come with me. Come. We'll walk downstairs and into the street. Come. It's day. It's daylight. How did it get to be daylight? It was just 9.30 at night. How did it get to be... Oh! Now, don't be alarmed. Please. But look at the cars. Look at them. Those cars are... 20 years old. All those cars. They're brand new. And they're Snyder's. That's Snyder's coffee shop across the street. We used to go there for lunch. All of us from the office. But they tore it down. Ten years ago, they built a new... You've gone back, Dottie. Don't you understand? You're not Dottie Malloy. You're still Dottie Sandy. And look at my dress. And these shoes. I threw these out long ago. No, no, I didn't. I remember... You wanted to go back, Dottie. You're back. I feel so... Young? Yes, that's it. I feel young. But tell me, why do I remember everything that takes place for the next 21 years? Why do I know that? Because you're not all the way back yet. Until that money is returned to the safe... Your new life hasn't really begun. Well, then let me go and return it. What are we waiting for? It's only 9.30 in the morning. You have to wait till 9 o'clock tonight. Oh. Well, what am I going to do until then? Go through the day. Just as you did last time. No, I'd like to change some of the things I did last time. You can only change one of them. The thing you did 9 o'clock at night. Say, we can't stand around here all day. You're late for work, and you know what a bear old Mr. Waterfield is. Well, goodbye, Daddy. Goodbye? Yes, goodbye. But when will I see you again, Mr. Carpenter? Never. Never? Never. Unless, of course, you don't live up to our bargain. Then I guess this is goodbye. Goodbye, Daddy. And good luck. Dottie. Hi, Jane. You're 40 minutes late. I know, I know. Old Waterfield is having a 14-carat fit. Honestly, he's given me such a headache. Oh, there he goes again. I'll get it. Yes, Mr. Waterfield. Well, where have you been? I I just got back, Mr. Waterfield. From where? I'm so glad you're here, Dottie. He makes me ill. Well, why don't you go lie down? <sighs> All right. If you don't feel any better going home. Oh, but Harold's taking me to dinner tonight. No. No, he isn't. What do you mean? Well, I mean he isn't. If you don't feel well. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you're right. I. Oh, I have to quit this job. That Mr. Waterfield, he makes me so nervous. I just wish Harold would ask me to marry him. <laughs> a minute. Now repeat that combination slowly. Twelve left. Twelve right. And around to zero twice. Yeah, yeah, I got it. Why do they always have to change the damn things? You know, sooner remember one combination that Miss Sanders, Dottie... I'm right here, sir. I was just coming in the door. Now make a note. I want Kelly to pick up 5,000 shares of International Motors of the market. International Motors? That's what I said. But... Wasn't there a big scandal? Scandal? What scandal? Yes, they went bankrupt. And the president, Abner Stilson, went to jail. Miss Sanders, have you taken leave of your senses? Excuse me, sir. What year is this? Well, now I know there's something wrong. That's right. It hasn't happened yet. And it won't for about a... I'm sorry, sir. Dottie, I have enough problems with that flighty one outside, that Jane. Now, don't you go haywire on me, too. I'm sorry, sir. Now... I want Peters to buy 2,000 shares of Midwest Steel. Uh, That is, if you approve. Midwest Steel? 
Sir, that's a... That's a what? That's a sleeper. That'll go to... Y- yes, yes, yes. Excuse me, sir. I'm just feeling... Oh, I don't know. I'm kind of wild this morning. Well, maybe you better see a doctor. No, sir, I'm all right. I... I'm just very happy. About what? Oh, about... About everything. <laughs> Hi, Daddy. Oh, hi, Harold. Uh, Jane isn't here. I know. She just wasn't feeling well, so she went home. I know. I didn't come to see Jane. Oh. I came to see you. Me? How about lunch? Oh, now, look, Harold. You have to eat, don't you? And I have to eat, and I happen to be in the neighborhood. When Jane happens to be my best friend. I like her, too. I don't do things that way. Tell you what, I'll really splurge. I'll take you to Ramaletti's. I'm sorry, Harold. What time do you go out? 12.45. Meet you downstairs. Yeah, I think I'll have the... Now, don't go looking for the cheapest thing on the menu. Boy, even the cheapest thing is practically out of sight. Daddy, you know what bothers me? What? That you're impressed by a place like this. Well, it's very expensive. (laughs) It's only money. And it's all you need to eat here. Actually, it's all you need to go anywhere. Do anything. Money. Well, I never had any money. I never did either. But I'm going to. I'm not going to be a salesman all my life. I intend to own a place. Oh, sure. Well, there are plenty of good locations. And I know how to sell. Yeah, you do have a wonderful personality, Harold. No reason why I shouldn't be on my own. Well, <laughs> there is a reason. What's that? Well, you can even sing it. Do, re, mi. <laughs> yes, indeed, Dottie. The good old cabbage leaves. Yeah. Well, that's a shame. Well, all it takes is a few thousand, five, six maybe, to get set up. Well, let's enjoy the here and now. <laughs> Why don't you try the rack of lamb? Where is it? Oh, Harold, that cost twelve dollars. It's delicious. I'm going to have it. Yeah, but twelve for you and twelve for me. That that's <laughs> just for lunch. It adds up to. It adds up to zero, Dottie. Twelve and twelve are zero. Why? What did you say? Nothing. No. What did you say? About twelve and twelve. I said twelve and twelve add up to zero. Twelve left, twelve right, and around to zero twice. What are you saying, Dottie? What are you saying? Oh, nothing. Nothing at all. But I think I will have the rack of lamb after all. Great. Did you ever have it before? Sure, once. Where? Here. Here? I thought you said you never ate here. Well, I did. And I didn't. (laughs) How you say the craziest things. I know. I think that's why I've fallen in love with you. Oh, how was the rack of lamb? It was not so hot. Well, in that case, let's not have it. No. We must. What are you saying? I'm saying we can't change anything. Just yet. So far, it's all on schedule. The day runs its course, just as it did 21 years ago. Dottie was late to work. She overheard the boss muttering the combination of the office safe. She stole her best friend's boyfriend. Stole may be a harsh word, but here we deal in realities. Realities so real that they can be considered fantastic. We'll find out how she handles the rest of the day when I return shortly with Act Three. Jack Ryan stars in the CBS Radio Mystery Theater presentation, The Locked House, tomorrow night at 10.30 p.m. on WBBM News Radio 78. This is WBBM Chicago. Sometimes you get a chance to do it all over again. Sometimes. And you know exactly how to handle the situation this time. There's absolutely no way to commit that fatal blunder. Because this time, you are forewarned, forearmed. You have foresight. How could you possibly do it wrong? Oh. Hello, Harold? No, it isn't Harold. Mr. 
Mr. Carpenter. Well, Harold was supposed to call me. He did last time. And he will again. And will I go to dinner with him? Yes. And do I have to go through that situation with Jane again? You know you do. And then you must come back here to... Oh, yes, I know. And I will. The only reason I called was to wish you luck. Oh, I don't need any luck. Remind you of what it is you have to do. And I have every intention of doing it. I'd better hang up. Because even now, Harold is dialing your number to ask you to dinner. Goodbye, Daddy. <laughs> From Ramalettis to Snyder's, all in one day. Well, I have to admit, the food's much cheaper here. Yeah, well, I think it's better. No, I have to improve your taste. Harold, what were you saying about going into business? Was I saying anything about... Yeah, at lunch. Oh, I always talk that way. It's it's just talk. Where could I ever get the kind of money it takes to... Well, you could save it. I don't make enough. Well, still, you could put it aside. Oh, sure, but you have to be the saving kind, and that's just not me. Yeah, but if you did have the money, just suppose... You mean, like, just suppose the moon is made out of green cheese? No, suppose. If I had it? Oh, that'd be a brand new ball game. I'd open my own store. I'd know what styles to buy. I'd know how to handle my customers. Oh, Dottie, I could make a fortune. I believe you would. Well, look, I don't do too badly now. I'm still the best salesman old man Westing has. I make enough to... To what? Well, listen to me. I have no trouble selling a suit of clothes. But I have all kinds of trouble selling myself. Well, don't oversell, Harold. Huh? I mean, you just about closed the deal. Dottie. No, no, don't. Don't kiss me, Harold, please. Don't you realize what you just said? Yeah. Yeah, I know. But first, I, I have to talk to Jane. Jane? Why? Well, because she... Dottie, I, I just dated Jane now and then. I never gave her any reason to think that... Well, was... I'm sure you didn't, but she seems to think so, and that's the same thing. But, look... No, no. I really feel I owe her an explanation. You were my friend. Jane. Yeah, yeah, I see it all now. Jane, there isn't anything to see except the truth. We just happened to fall in love with each oh, other. Oh, take him. Take him in good riddance. He's just a phony. Big, good looking, but not a brain in his head. You'll never get anywhere, you'll never be anybody, and you'll never have anything. You'll wind up supporting him. Oh, no, Jane. It's for the best. I know it's for the best. You don't see it now, but you will. Later. I never want to see you again. Now, don't stand there. Get out. All right, James. All right. Daddy. Daddy. Please. For your own sake, give him back to me. Daddy, look at you. So pretty and so smart. You could do so much better than Harold. Don't let him ruin your life. Me? What does it matter? I know, I'm just playing Jane. He's good enough for me, but he's not good enough for you. I know. You know? Well, then why? I can't help it, Jane. I can't help it. Did you tell her? Yes, I told her. Was it bad? Yeah, it was pretty bad. I'm sorry. Well, it's nobody's fault. Well, look, it's still early enough. How about a movie? Harold. Harold, could you really make a go of it? Make a go of what? Your own business. Well, sure, but oh, that's just a wild dream. Well, the wildest dreams can come true. Well, we're so serious tonight. Let's see a funny movie. Harold, could you make a go of your own business? I have to know. Well, the answer is sure. I could make a million bucks. All I need is the chance. Now, how about that movie? No. I want to go home. I have a headache. Sure you just want to go to sleep? Yeah. 
I'm sure. It's been such a great day. I, I hate to see it end. Well, I guess I'm just overexcited. After all, a girl doesn't get a proposal every day. <laughs> Why don't I come by for you in the morning? We'll have breakfast and lunch and dinner. And maybe in between we can get married. <laughs> And very soon, I, I I want my family to come in from the West Coast. I'll be by bright and early in the a.m. Are you happy? Yes. Yes. You're beautiful, Dottie. See you, Angel. Taxi! Taxi! Would you take me to the Waterfield Prentice Building? 12th in Maine. Twelve right. Twelve left. And around to zero. Twice. And I'm right. It opens. What are you doing uh, at the safe, Dottie? Jerry. Oh, Jerry, you scared me. Well, you see, uh... Mr. Waterfield called and asked me if I could take this money to... Now, that ain't so, Dottie. He didn't ask you nothing of the sort. But I tell you, he did. Besides, you ain't supposed to know the combination. How'd you happen to learn the combination? Well, I... I, I... Well, what's the difference? You you, you, you were tempted. I, I can understand that, Dottie. Jerry, I need this money. It's not just for me. It's to help somebody... And it's only $20,000. What does $20,000 mean to old man Waterfield? Listen to me, Jerry. I'll, I'll give you some of it. Here, take 5000 No, Dottie. No. Why don't we split it? Put the money back. Lock the safe. And we'll both forget about tonight. No. I'm taking this money. Put it back, Dottie. Well, of course, of course I'll put it back. Now you're talking sense. After all, that's what I came back here for. You'll be happier in the long run. That's the kind of money that never brings anything good. This way, you'll always have your peace of mind. Sure, sure. You're being smart, Dottie. Jerry, listen to me. I'm not really going to take this money. No? No. I'm just going to borrow it. And you're right, I was a stupid, immature kid that time, that last time. But not this time, Jerry. This time. Do you know what I know? No. Now listen, Dottie. This time, I know all the stocks that are going to go up. All the horses that are going to win. Listen, this year, this year, the socks are going to win the pennant. No, I know you're crazy. The socks are going to come from nowhere to win it 100 to 1. Dottie, you're out of your mind. And Sweet Reward is going to win the derby. And there's a stock, Midwest Steel. If you get in on it right now, Jerry, I know so many things. Dottie, just put the money back. Yeah, I will, Jerry, I will. Right No, now. not right now. Tomorrow. I just want to borrow it for one day. Please, Dottie, I don't want you to get into trouble. I need the cash just for a few hours. Jerry, you and I will be millionaires. Please trust me, believe me. Put it back. Get Dottie. out of my way. I'll have to report you. I'm not stealing it. I'll put it back tomorrow. Tomorrow night, you'll uh, see. Dottie, right now, there's no harm done Let yet. Let go of me. Please, Dottie, I'm trying no. to help you. Don't get your hand. I have to stop you, Dottie. I'm it's not my job. stealing this money. Don't you understand? I'm not stealing it. Put it back. Put it back. I don't want to hurt you, Jerry. You're put an old man. Money. Back. Please. Jerry, I have this... Gift. I can see into the future. You'll be able to retire. Put it, put it back. I will, I will. My heart. Jerry. In my pocket. My shirt pocket. What? I've got pills. Oh, please, please, please. Uh, don't die on me. Please don't uh, die. Uh, uh, Jerry. I'm afraid he's dead. <gasps> Mr. Carpenter. Yes. Mr. Carpenter. Well, I didn't kill him. He died of a heart attack. You saw it? Yes, I saw and I heard everything. Well, now we take a dim view of this sort of thing at Opportunities Unlimited. We do indeed. Well, don't you see what I was trying to do for him? I had to give him an opportunity to, 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 to better himself. But that was not our agreement. You had agreed to put the money back. What? What are you going to do to me? I won't do anything to you. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll put the money back right now. Where will you put it? In the safe, on the wall, 
In which safe on what wall? It's dark. How did it get so dark? What happened to the light? No, you can keep the money. I can keep the money? Certainly. For all the good it will do you. Oh, it'll do me plenty of good now. Now I know how to use it. I can do things that... Where are the lights? The lights? Yes, where are the lights? Hey, what's that noise? The lights, as you know. They won't be invented for at least a thousand years. What? The noise, where... Where am I? Where am I? I would say you're on the southern coast of England. The year is 874. How could I... Go back to 874. You're hiding in a tiny hut. The noise is that of a Viking raid. Oh. The village is burned, looted. There's quite a bit of murder, robbery, rape. Why? What are you saying? That's how things were in those days. Besides, why worry? You have money. Those pretty little pieces of green paper. Will they kill me? I don't know. Oh, please. Please, Mr. Carpenter. They don't kill everybody. And you've got $20,000 in good American money. Oh, please, please, please save me. They're right you've outside. You've got $20,000, Dottie. Let's see you buy your way out of this one. Dottie was lucky in one sense. The chief of the Viking raiders was Eric the Red. He had an eye for pretty ladies. So instead of killing her, he kept her for himself. So, basic relationships didn't really change. Instead of keeping house for Harold Malloy, she kept house for Eric the Red. And talking about houses... Don't you leave the house till I come back shortly. Can you go all the way back and forth in time? Before you answer no, consider. Practically all of you have already done it. How, you ask? Well... Don't you set your clocks for daylight savings time? Ah, but that's only an hour. Sure, but it's the principle. Remember, the greatest oak was once a tiny acorn. Our cast included Mercedes McCambridge, Patricia Wheel, Robert Maxwell, and Leon Janney. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg's Special K cereal, new sugar-free diet 7-Up, and Sign Off, the sinus medicines. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams... E.G. Marshall. Welcome to the vivid world of your own imagination, to the miracle of your own mind's eye. We have all of us found ourselves at times in one predicament or another and wondered how in the world we got there. Like Fran and Martin Halliday, for instance. If he's going to kill us, why doesn't he get it over with? Ever see a cat play with a mouse, Fran? He's, he's... he's the cat, Fran, dear. We're the mice.
mystery drama, Hurricane, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by George Lothar and stars Joseph Julian and E.V. Juster. It is sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser, and by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg's Special K cereal. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Imagine yourself now in a beach house on the eastern shore of Florida. It's a wild and isolated part of the shore. And right now, the savage wind and rain of a hurricane are bludgeoning the house. In the living room, two men are playing Scrabble by the light of a kerosene lamp. One of them is quite young, in his 20s. His left eye is badly bruised, half closed. The other man is old, in his mid-thirties, perhaps. He is wearing a shoulder holster with a 38 caliber revolver in it. Turn the radio on, Ronnie. Let's get the latest on the hurricane. Ronnie. Yeah? Don't get any fancy ideas. Don't make any sudden moves. What ideas? What moves? You could put a bullet in me before I got halfway to the door. And don't think I would. Oh, it's in Hurricane Donna. Atlantic, heading north by northwest from the Florida east coast. Winds up to 90 miles per hour have already been clocked at the Weather Bureau station in Miami, which warns that they are expected to reach a velocity of 110 miles per hour. I told you, no oh, sudden moves. Minute, Get I away from that down. window. I thought I heard a car. I, the key. I did. The of the overland highway, a Joe, there's a car today. in the drive. Two people, a man and a woman, getting out. They're coming in. The Damn. Shore of the keys have been Shut that thing off. And in well, let me handle this. Don't north give me any trouble, understand? Whatever you say, Joe... Yeah. We're sorry to trouble you, but will you let us in, please? I'm sorry, lady. We, the Overland Highway's underwater up ahead. We can't go on. We can't go back. You've got to take us in. There's a beach house about a half a mile. There was. It's been washed away. Oh. Well. Look, look, you can't turn us away. Not in this. Yeah. yeah. All right. Come in. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm Martin Halliday. This is my wife, Fran. And you? Joe. Joe Carrington. And I'm Ronnie Prentice. You uh, may have heard of my father. All right, they don't want your life history. Pleasure meeting you. Say, that's quite a black eye you've got. Yeah, I got it. We went down to the dock uh, to secure our boat. Ronnie slipped. Oh, that's too bad. I can't help noticing, Mr. Carrington. His gun. What about it? Well, a little unusual, isn't it? I mean, wearing a shoulder holster and a gun in a house <laughs> makes me feel as if I'd walked into a Humphrey Bogart movie. Maybe you have. Oh? What do you mean, Mr. Prentice? He didn't mean anything. Making a joke is all. Hmm. Where are you from, you two? Siesta Key. Uh, yes, we have a little beach house there. A shack, really. A kind of get-away-from-it-all place. Get away from all what? We're school teachers. Jacksonville. Fran teaches English, and I'm what you call a student counselor. Oh, you, uh, give advice to kids? Well, they're not exactly kids. Not at 17 and 18. High school, yes. But at that age, adolescents have lots of problems, believe me. And, uh, you straighten them out. Well, let's say I try. My husband has a degree in clinical psychology. Oh, very interesting. Well, I'll be back in a moment. Where are you going? Well, to heat up the coffee, Joe. They look like they could use some. Well, what well, they need is a drink. Forget the coffee. Well, I don't need a drink. I, I'd rather have the coffee, thank you. Yeah, me too. Well, I'll get it. Uh, no, wait. Uh, excuse me. I'll give him a hand in the kitchen. Martin, there's something funny going on here. Yeah, I noticed the way Carrington, the one with the gun, kept watching the younger one like, well... A cat watching a mouse. I noticed that too, but what I mean, the younger one, Ronnie, he seemed to be trying to warn me about something. What do you mean, warn you? I don't know. I could be wrong, but there was something, it seemed to me, something in his eyes. As if he were trying to warn me. 
with his eyes. And speaking of eyes, I don't think he got that shiner in a fall. Neither do I. I'll come and get it, hot and steaming. Oh, I can use a cup of that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Here we are. There's cream and sugar. You can help yourself. Oh, thank you. How do you take yours, Mr. Prentice? Uh, black. And it's runny. Oh, well. Fran, then. Okay. There you are. Mr. Carrington? Uh, none for me. Uh, you play Scrabble, Fran? I <laughs> love it. Well, how about a game with me? Of course. You know, come to think of it, maybe I'm biting off more than I can chew, taking on an English teacher. <laughs> what do you want, a handicap? <laughs> this is a nice place you've got here, Mr. Carrington. I've been admiring some of the paintings on the walls. Who's the artist? A friend of mine. A distinctive technique. Mm, he's got talent. And uh, problems. You think so? Oh, no offense. No, I... no, no offense. I'm, I'm interested. What makes you think he's got problems? Well, there's something curious about the way... The way... Yeah? Well, it's hard to put into words. See, here in this landscape, that distant farmhouse is only partially finished. And here, here again, these trees are only half painted in. As if, well, there's something wrong. As if the artist, for some reason, went just so far and no further. As if something stopped him. You shrinks are all alike. I beg pardon? Your wife said you were a psychologist. So? So right away you got to read something into this painting. Like the artist has problems because he didn't finish painting this or painting that. Maybe he ran out of paint. Did he? What? He's a friend of yours, you said. You know him. Did he run out of paint? Or does he just not finish what he starts? Hey, now take it easy, Joe. Why pull a gun on us? I just accidentally upset the Scrabble game, that's all. I thought you were going to shoot me. You're pretty edgy, Carrington. Sorry. You're practically a nervous Um, man. All that happened was Ronnie upset the Scrabble game. I said I I said I was sorry. Now, here, let me help you pick up the pieces. (gasps) Then maybe we could all sit down and play. How about it, Mr. Halliday? Sure. Sure, help pass the time. Uh, You count me out. I'm going to lie down for a while. A few minutes ago, you wanted to play. Well, I don't now. Nonsense. You like Scrabble. Not when I'm up against an English teacher. She was beating the socks off me. We'll all play. Now sit down, Ronnie. Uh Uh-uh. I'm sleepy, Joe. Uh, I'm going to catch a nap. Looks like we'll have to play three. Yeah, yeah. As soon as I get back. I won't be a minute. Martin, that boy's in trouble. Where'd you get that idea? He didn't upset the Scrabble game accidentally. He did it deliberately. After he spelled out the words, help me. Help me? Yes. I looked at the words then, at him, and he looked in Carrington's direction. Martin, that boy's in danger. Maybe we are, too. Joe, no, please, don't handcuff me to the bed. You're up to something out there, Ronnie. I'm not taking any chances. I swear, I wasn't up to anything at all. You think I haven't noticed the looks between you and her? You think I haven't seen you trying to tell her something with your eyes? And why did you upset that Scrabble game? It was an accident. Yeah, some accident. And all of a sudden, you're sleepy and you want to take a nap. Do you think you're kidding? Next thing I know, you'd be out that window trying to escape. With a hurricane raging out there, how far do you think I'd get? I don't think, I know. You're not getting beyond this bed. After these handcuffs on, you're not. We've got to do something. Fran, I warn you again, don't rush into something you'll be sorry for. But we've got to help that boy. For all we know, we've got to help ourselves. Martin, he's got a gun, and he's... Uh, More coffee before we start playing? No, thank you. Change your mind about a drink, Halliday? Why, uh, yes. Yes, I think I will. Uh, And on second that, I... I, I'll change mine about the coffee. Help yourself. Scotch, bourbon, rye, what'll it be? What? Oh, uh, uh bourbon, thanks. Coffee's cold. Mind if I heat it up, Mr. Carrington? Oh, of course not. There's a gas stove in the kitchen. Lucky we don't cook with electricity. It all went off hours ago. Kitchen's through that door. I'll just be a few minutes. Keep your voice 
Down Ron. Fran, you're soaked to the skin, drenched. I pretended I wanted to heat up the coffee, but I really wanted to get to you. I went out the kitchen door and came around to this window. Ronnie, what's the trouble? He's holding me for ransom. Ransom? He wants $100,000. A hundred... My father is Garrett Prentice, the millionaire. Oh, I've heard of him, yes. Phil Carrington, if that's his name, phoned my father yesterday. The money is on the way, but... What worries me is I'm sure Carrington's going to kill me once he gets it. But if he gets the ransom money... I don't think it'll make any difference. He knows I can identify him, so he hasn't much choice. He has to kill me. You and your husband, too. Yes. We could identify him. You've got to do something. We've got to do something. But what? That's the question, Ronnie. What? She's taking her own sweet time about heating that coffee. Well, here she is now. Where have you been? Hey, your clothes are soaking wet. How did it happen, Fran? While the coffee was heating, I went to the kitchen door and opened it. What for? Well, to see what it was like out there. The wind caught the door and yanked it open. I went out to try to close it and... You're lying. What have you been up to? I haven't been up to anything. You went out the kitchen door and around back, didn't you? You made your way to the bedroom. No, I swear I didn't. Well, I'll soon find out. I'll go see. <laughs> Man, have you gone crazy? You hit him with that candlestick. You knocked him cold. Get his gun and the key to the handcuffs out of his pocket. Handcuffs? Ronnie's handcuffs to the bed in there. Good Lord. Hey, here, take the gun while I hunt for the key. Now, not this pocket. Yeah, here. Keep him covered, Fran. I'll release Ronnie. Mr. Halliday. It's okay, Ronnie. I don't know what this is all about yet. But I'll soon have these cuffs off you. Oh, Carrington's out cold. There. Oh, good. Where's his gun? My wife's got it. Keeping Carrington covered. Come on. He's still out, huh? Yes. All right, I'll take the gun, friend. Yes. Here, I don't want it. I don't even like the feel of it. Where's my husband? Well, still in the bedroom, I guess. What in the world is he doing in... Martin? Martin, what are you doing in there? Coming. I stopped to have a closer look at this. Well, what is it? It was hanging on the wall in his bedroom. But what is it? A straitjacket, Fran. A straitjacket? Ronnie, what would a straitjacket be doing in your... Oh, my God. That's right, Fran. You see, I'm insane. Joe used that straitjacket to keep me quiet when I got violent. Really violent. <laughs> but he won't be using it on me anymore. Not anymore. Thanks to you. As I said, we sometimes find ourselves in predicaments... And wonder how we got there. Well, Fran and Martin Halliday needn't wonder how they got into theirs. They know. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. There are those who say we cannot escape what the fates have ordained shall be our future. Others contend that we create our own destinies, masters of our fate, captains of our soul, and all that. I don't know. Seems to me there's such a thing as luck, good and bad. And as Fran and Martin Halliday stare into the barrel of a gun held by Ronnie Prentice, I'd say they're just victims of circumstance. Wouldn't you? Joe uses a straitjacket on you when you become violent? He did. But as I just told you, he won't anymore. Thanks to you, dear impulsive Fran Halliday. Uh, uh, Carrington's coming around. and see if I can help him. Leave him. He could be seriously hurt. Let's hope so. My head. My head. Johnny. How did you get that gun? She gave it to me. After she took it away from you. Oh. Maybe you made a big mistake. He told me you'd kidnapped him. We're holding him for ransom. And you swallowed that? I'm afraid I did. 
No, don't blame yourself too much. Ronnie's con smarter people than you. Oh, thank you. Thanks very much. Oh, no, you shouldn't have said that, Joe. You've offended her. She's an obvious narcissus type. You should have realized that. As you did. Well, of course. That's why I went after her sympathy instead of his. I knew she'd be a pushover. Wow. Quite the amateur psychologist. Amateur? I love a lot better psychologist than you are, Halliday. I'm not wasting my life as a kid counselor. And what's that supposed to mean? Ronnie, give me the gun. Oh, you gotta be kidding. Oh, Ronnie. One more step, Joe, and I'll kill you. No. Not me. Not after all these years. How many, Joe? I've lost count. Nineteen. In four months and 27 days. Oh, that's a long time. You never know how long. The gnawing tooth of time. Well, it's over now, Joe. End of the line and no transfer. No transfer for you either if you kill me. I'll put you in the asylum, Ron. Not me. Too clever. Wow, well, would you all like a drink, or we, uh, is the situation sufficiently intoxicating? Your friend? No, thank you. Halibut? Not me. How about you, dear brother Joe? Dear, dedicated, generous, self-sacrificing, moderate brother. Dear, gentle, understanding, all-suffering keeper! Hit me just once again, Ron. And... And what? Skip it. <laughs> I'm going over to the bar to make myself a drink. Now, all of you stay right where you are. Don't move. Not an inch. I said not an inch. Well, I was only going to sit down in this chair and... Oh! Oh, my jaw. I'll do more than felt you with this gun if you disobey me again. Now, don't move. Not an inch. Martin. Oh, Martin, I'm sorry. It's not your fault. Are you sure you don't want a drink? Anyone? It's your last chance, you know. Well, I'll suit yourselves. And now, who's first? You, Halliday? Yeah, why not you? Just one bullet through the head. Painless. So don't be afraid. Ron, don't do it. Are you afraid, Halliday? I... I don't think so. No. Not afraid of death? How come? Oh, I... I don't know. I guess if you believe in God, and I do, I guess you... Well, you can't be very much afraid of anything, really. Well, many people who believe in God are afraid to die, wouldn't you say? No. I don't see how they could be afraid if they did. Oh, a provocative speculation. Give me the gun, Ron. Oh, you're afraid, aren't you? When I point the gun at you like this and you don't know whether I'm going to pull the trigger or not, you are afraid, aren't you, Joe? I certainly don't want to die. Yet you believe in God. Maybe I do and maybe I don't. You do? You do? You told me you did. I remember a long time ago, you told me that you did. You did. Okay, I did. Now you're trying to confuse me. You... He, 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 he does it all the time. He keeps making me think I got things twisted, all mixed up, that I'm that I'm not thinking straight, that I'm crazy. Now, don't start that with me, Joe. No, I'm warning you. Don't start. All right, Ron. And then don't take that tone either. You know I can't stand that tone. Ron. I will not be treated like a child in a tantrum. I will not, Joe. I will not. Then why don't you stop behaving like one? Halliday, don't cross him. Why not? Go ahead, Halliday. Cross me. Say anything you like to me. Anything. And see what happens. You won't? Well, then how about you, Fran? You say something. You, you cross me. Oh, won't you please let us go? Please. We have nothing to do with all of this. We just happened to come in here out Look, of the... save it. You can't reason with a homicidal maniac. He... He really is? Yes, Mrs. Halliday. He really is. Liar! Liar! Oh, clever. Oh, oh yeah, clever. But not as clever as I am. You see, he wants my father's money all for himself. There's enough for both, more than enough. When my father goes to that great hunt club in the sky, he a marvelous huntsman, my father. Red coat, breeches, top hat, oh, the whole bit. Da -da 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 hunting we will go. We all fall down and go smash. Smash! <laughs> but not for him. Oh, never smash for him. For me. For me. 
What do you mean, smash for you? Would you like... Would you like to know? Would you... Would you really be interested? I would, yes. No, we... <laughs> we never tell about it, do we, Joe? Never have, never will. What would father's friends say? Gary Prender's father, the maniac. That's what they'd say. Garrett Prentice would shrivel up with shame. Who exactly is Garrett Prentice? Who is... Oh, Joe, here, here's a man who never heard a father of a wonderment. A, a rare Alvis. My dear man, where have you been? Everyone has heard a father. I'm afraid I'm not in that category. Oh, then let, let, let me tell you about him. All about him. And about Joe and me. No, no, don't, please. No, it's no. the last stop, Joe. Final destination. Why not open the luggage? You won't be taking it with you. You see, Joe's mama married my dear papa after his papa died. Now, in, as you might say, the ordinary course of biological eventuality, I appeared on the scene. And alas, poor Joe's mama left it. Joe hated me for killing his mama. No, Ron, I never... You did. You did. If you didn't, why did you hit me and knock me down and make me hurt my head? I didn't mean to. You were two years old, almost two. You always wanted whatever I had, a toy, a game, whatever. That day, well, I wouldn't give up what you wanted, and I pushed you away. You knocked me down. You knocked me down, and you hurt my head, Joe. I did injure him. I am responsible. When I pushed him and he fell... Knocked down? All right, Ron. When I knocked him down, he struck his head on the metal corner of a bed. He was unconscious for more than an hour. When... when, when Go on. When the doctor brought him around, he seemed all right. Except for headaches that bothered him from time to time. But otherwise, all right. Then when he was about four, he tried to kill his governess. At four? Yeah, he wanted her to give him something. I don't remember what. And she wouldn't. And he, he flew into a rage. He bit. He clawed. He kicked her. Small as he was, she was no match for him. And he'd have killed her if other servants hadn't come in time and dragged him off. And then a year or so later, he attacked a playmate. Boy his age. And, and he would have killed him if there hadn't been other boys who pulled him away. Good heavens. From then on, he couldn't be sent to school. He had to be tutored at home. He'd fly into these sudden, unexpected rages, attack his tutors. He nearly murdered one with a pair of scissors. The psychiatrist who examined him, did they have him? He's any... never been to a psychiatrist. Oh, you can't mean that. It's true. But that's... It's senseless. Garrett Prentice, senseless? Wealthy financier, handsome playboy, beloved darling of the jet set, senseless? Oh, no. Heartless, yes. Oh, God, yes, heartless. He couldn't bear the shame, the notoriety of others knowing. But, Carrington, Joe, you can't mean that all these years you've taken care of him alone. It was my fault. So you took on the burden of... Wouldn't you? You've dedicated your entire life to him. Oh, it isn't as bad as you make it sound. Most of the time, he's rational enough. Our lives are quite ordinary, except... I have to keep watching for the signs, the symptoms that warn me that another attack is coming on. I try to give him as much freedom as I can. Still, I do have to keep an eye on him. And you know I hate being watched. But you only know how it feels to have someone's eyes glued on you all the... Why are you looking at me like that, Holiday? Like what? Is it... As if you're studying me. Uh, I don't know what you mean. Yes, you do. Answer me. Answer me or I'll put a hole in your head. No! Uh, Take that gun away from his temple. Easy, Fran, easy. All right. I have been studying you. Why? There's something... I can't put my finger on it, but... Something... I've known kids. Well, young men and women, really. High school seniors who... Who seem rational at times. It's only the calm before the storm, Halliday. It's one of those symptoms that I mentioned. The silence before the volcano erupts, eh, Joe? Something like that. And then, boom, I erupt. Well, better to do that than to hold it in and let it eat you alive inside like most people. Like you, Halliday. Me? Nothing's eating me. Liar. 
You're all but eaten up with bitterness, frustration. <laughs> you, you, you couldn't be more off base, believe me. Am I? Ask her. Ask Fran. She knows. Am I right, Fran? <laughs> well, answer him, Fran. He's right. <laughs> you see? Oh, come on, Fran. He is right, Martin. You know it. I know it. We just never talk about it, that's all. Talk about what? Nothing. Forget it. No. You just said that he's right. That I am eaten alive inside with frustrations, regrets. You are? Darling, you know you are. You never mention it because... Well, because you're you. Oh, Lord, Fran. Are you... Are you talking about what happened at State College? Is there anything else we don't talk about since it happened? But in heaven's name, Fran, that was 12 years ago. It makes no sense. Doesn't it? Oh, Martin. Dear, darling Martin. Doesn't it? You know, maybe it does. Maybe it does at that. If all these years you've been thinking that I... Because I never talked, thinking you ruined my life. I did. You know I did. Ruined it? Fran, dearest, you made it. How could you have lived with me all these years and not know that I... I, What a fool I've been. You? Yes, me, a so-called psychologist. Not knowing you'd feel guilty. That you'd... But, Martin... You've kept silent about it all these years. Kept silent? Nothing. I haven't kept silent. I just haven't talked to you about it because I scarcely ever think about it. And when I do, I'm glad it happened. You're just saying that. I'm not saying anything. I'm telling you the truth. Too late. Too late. Just too late. Because I'm sick of all this talk. The time has come to erupt. To strike. I think. Now I'm sure. I'll strike at you first, dear friend. <gasps> oh, yes. I'll kill you first. Surely a twist of fate. An ironic twist. When in the very instant, Martin Halliday discovers that, all unknowingly, he and his wife have misunderstood each other over the years, the homicidal maniac Ron Prentice kills Fran Halliday. I'll return in a moment with Act Three. This is WBBM Chicago. isn't it? That no matter how intimately our lives are bound up with another's, we never really know what he's like underneath. What he truly thinks, truly feels. It's almost inconceivable that Fran Halliday would believe that her husband Martin has been eaten up with bitterness and frustration over something she did 12 years ago, when actually the reverse is true. But no matter now, it seems, because Ron Prentice has just fired point blank at Fran. Uh, Fran! Uh, Fran! Uh, I'm, I'm all right, I think. He, he missed. Well, lucky uh, you, Fran. You jerked your head up uh, at the right moment or you'd be dead with a uh, bullet between your eyes right now. Uh, fool, you crazy fool. Am yeah, I, dear brother? You won't think so when I finally decide to kill you, too. If you kill any one of us, it'll be the end for you, Ron. Oh, no, not an end. A beginning i put you away behind bars in an asylum for the criminally insane. You could never bear that ride. I've borne it for nearly 20 years. 19 years, 4 months, 27 days, as you said. What are you talking about? You've lived an almost normal life. I've seen to that. Yeah, never a day out of your sight. The feel of your eyes always on me, waking, sleeping. You were always there. Never alone, never. 
Handcuffed, straightjacketed, chained. Chained to you. Chained. You think I have never wanted to be alone? To live my life? To fall in love, marry, have kids? Even to go for a walk by myself? You think it's been any easier for me? Chained to you? You made the chain, not me. You. And now I'm going to break it, Joe. Once and for all. Break. No, don't shoot. Run, please. I beg you. Don't. Hey, look. Ah! I thought we were finished. You are. What? The house can't last. They said on the radio these winds were at 110, 120 miles an hour. And that's what they're starting to do. And we damn well better ought to get out of here. Where can we go? To the beach. There are caves down there. We can make it. No, dear brother. Not you. Me. What do you mean? You. Fran, go into the bedroom and get those handcuffs my brother used on me. What are you up to? You'll find a second set in the top bureau drawer. Joe always kept a spare. Bring the straitjacket, too. I, I, I don't... Do as I tell you. And don't get any fancy ideas, or it'll be the end of these two. Do as he says, Mrs. Halliday. All right. What rotten scheme have you dreamed up now, Ron? Oh, not me. The hurricane. The hurricane dreamed it up. What the hell are you talking about? That. Just that. Those winds are getting worse. The house can't last. It'll be ripped up. Torn asunder, smashed to kindling. You, all three of you, will be smashed to kindling. Human kindling with it. Ah, here's impulsive Fran with the handcuffs and the straitjacket. You, Holiday, put that straitjacket on, Brother Joe. Ron, Ronnie, you can't do this. I'm not. You are. Get that jacket on him. Now! He means what he says, Halliday. He'll kill you if you don't obey him. Come on, now. Get this jacket on me. Halliday! If I could only be sure... Oh, what, Martin? Sure of what? That he won't... That he can't... Shoot to kill. Try me, Halliday. I'm gonna count five. If you haven't got that straight jacket on Joe, I'll put a bullet through your head. And he can do it. He's a crack shot. Then how come he missed Fran? I missed because... Don't you... give me that. Fran couldn't have jerked her head fast enough to avoid the bullet. You missed. Deliberately missed. Why? Halliday, you're pushing your luck. Maybe. I'm not saying I couldn't be wrong. No one ever really knows what's in another man's head. But if I'm right... Martin! Give me the gun, Ron. I warn you, put that straight jacket on Joe or I'll kill you here and now. I don't think so. If you were going to shoot us... You'd have done it instead of talking about it. How are they? I've been sizing you up, Ron. The way I size up high school kids sent to me when they're in trouble. They do a lot of talking, too. A lot of bluster, a lot of bluff. Half the time, not knowing it is nothing but bluff because nobody's called them on it. Well, I'm calling you. Here and now, calling you, Ron. One more step. Halliday, in heaven's name, you're not dealing with a high school kid. You're dealing with a maniac. That's the chance I'm taking, Joe. That your brother is no more insane than I am. Well, you are insane if you think he isn't. I've been with him night and day all his life. I tell you, he's mad. I don't believe it. He believes it. Oh, yes, he believes it, all right. Right now, this minute, he believes he'll shoot to kill me. But I'm gambling that when the chips are down, he'll throw in his hand. Oh, you seem very sure of yourself, Halliday. I'm anything but sure, Ron. But what have I got to lose? If I don't take that gun from you, we'll all die when the hurricane destroys the house. Even if you do shoot to kill, and do kill me, it'll give Joe a chance to get that gun away from you. Joe? Yeah? Get ready. If he shoots me, you'll have a split second to jump him. Okay? Okay. Martin! Take it easy, Fran. All right, Ron. One more step and you're dead. Not if I'm right about you, Ronnie. I'm willing to take a calculated risk based on what I've learned about you in the past hour. Learned? About me? You nearly killed your governess, Joe said, when you were a child. But didn't. I was stopped before I could. Were you? Or could you have killed her before anyone came to save her? but held off until they came. What about the playmate you tried to murder? 
Somehow you didn't succeed there either. Or the tutor you nearly killed with the scissors. Or my wife, Fran. Those pictures on the walls. You painted them, didn't you? What of it? None of them. Not one is finished. That's what of it. Why? Because you don't finish anything you start. You want to know the truth as I see it, Ronnie? I don't give a damn what... As I see it, when you were a child and Joe knocked you down, yes, you were knocked unconscious. But when you came to, you felt a, a, a warmth, a security you'd never felt before. Because for the first time in your life, you were the center of attention. Especially your father's attention. You felt it. Loved it. Wanted more of it. Wanted to shoot. You... You... you. As time went on and you got no more attention. You missed it. Yearned for it. Then, one day, as I see it, when your governess refused to give you something you wanted, you flew at her in a childish tantrum. A tantrum, Ronnie. That's all it was. But again, you got attention. And again, you found it pleasurable and wanted more. And had found a way to get more. Am I right? You can't be. Ron, if I'm right, for nearly 20 years, you've been playing at being insane without knowing you were playing. You've told yourself a lie, the same lie, so often you came to believe it. But the fact is, you're not insane at all. Ron... For the last time, give me that gun. All right, then. I'll take it from you. Ow! No, no! You killed him! I knew he would. I was right. Your husband was wrong. We won't need the straitjacket now. All right, Joe, handcuff her to the water pipe. Move! Yes, run. Yes. No. Oh, All right, now handcuff yourself to her. Run. They'll come after you. They'll put you away. Do as I say. All right. All right. And now, goodbye, Joe. In a little while, the house will be gone, and you with it. <laughs> I'll be free of you. <laughs> Three of you! <laughs> At last! At last! Miss Holiday. What? Miss Holiday. What? The hurricane's getting worse. We can't last long. I just want to say, I'm sorry you got caught up in all this. It was my fault. No, no, no. If I hadn't released your brother, I... Oh. Oh. I... Martin! That was Martin! He just moved! He isn't dead. Oh, dear Lord, how can he be alive? He's here! We didn't get a chance to look at him close up. That bullet could have only creased his skull. Oh, oh thank God, thank God. Oh, Martin. Here, look over here. Huh? We're handcuffed together. Here. Fran. Oh, my. Fran. Joe. What happened? Ron shot you. Oh, here. Here, my... Oh, my head. He went to the caves on the beach. He left us handcuffed to this pipe. Oh, Got to get out of here. There's no way, Halliday. We're handcuffed to this water pipe. He got the keys? Yes. We're hooked. Not, not if I was right. What about Ron? You were wrong. He shot you, didn't he? No, but didn't, didn't kill me. He, he could have. That shot, you said. But he didn't. And, and that means... That means... What, Martin? Oh. It means what? He'll be back to save us. Oh, you're nuts. He, he can't go through with it. He never has before. He won't now. He'll be back. The question is, will he come in time? There isn't much. This could be it. We can't last much longer. I, 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 I can 
stand, they fought their way to the caves on the beach, even as the house exploded into flying wreckage. I'll be back shortly. So, curiously, out of possible death came new life for Joe Carrington and his half-brother Ron, and for Fran and Martin Halliday. It's trite to say, I suppose, but God does work in mysterious ways. Consider, if 12 years ago, Fran had not sounded off impetuously to the dean's wife, Joe and Ron would still be bound to each other in misery. And Martin would never have found the life he finds so rich and rewarding. Consider that. Our cast included Joe Julian, Evie Juster, Jack Grimes, and Gordon Gould. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by New Sugar-Free Diet 7-Up, Contact, the 12-Hour Allergy Capsule, and Buick Motor Division. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. to tell you a very important story. Have you ever looked at your children and wondered, what in the world are they thinking? What goes on in those tiny minds? You don't know, do you? Admit it, you haven't the faintest idea. Yet, you were once a child. So why don't you know? I'll tell you why. You have forgotten and try as you will, you simply cannot remember what it was like to be a child. I don't know the reason for this, but perhaps it's because being a child is not always the happy thing we think it is. Didn't you mind being shut up in that dark room, Bobby? All by yourself for such a long time? Was it a long time? Three weeks. Is that a long time? What did you do, Bobby, all alone there? Oh... Listen to the silence. Talk to the dark. Our mystery.
mystery drama, The Secret Life of Bobby Deland, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Elspeth Eric and stars Michael Tolan. It is sponsored in part by Contact, the 12-hour allergy capsule, and Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. I'll be back shortly with Act One. said earlier that this story is an important one. Not because our small hero is an important figure. A boy of ten? How much time has he had to achieve importance in our world? No. We call our story important because it is our attempt to explore the inner life of one small child. An attempt which we admit may be awkward and incomplete because we have grown up and in growing up Grown stupid. All right now, children. Children, playtime's over. Everybody inside. Go with Miss Hamill and Mr. Garth. <laughs> now we can talk better. Well, Mr. Collin, have you finally made up your mind about adoption? I, uh, I don't know that we want to go that far, Mrs. Appleton. Not, not just yet. You see, I thought if my wife and I could take one of the children home for a a month, two months, see how it worked out. You see, our our son died in an automobile accident a year ago. And Mrs. Carlin hasn't been really right since. Depressed, migraine, headaches, spends a good deal of time in bed. And I thought if there were a boy around the house, it might help her. Help me, too. You've been here several times, I... You've met all our children. There's, there's one. I believe his name is Bobby. About ten years old. Bobby Deland? That's the one. I, I looked for him today when I was walking around the playground. I didn't see him. He's, he's still here, isn't he? Bobby's still here. Oh, thank goodness. He's such an unusual boy. I'm surprised he wasn't asked for before this. He was. Uh, last year... It didn't work out. Can you tell me why? I can do better than that. I have a tape of the interview with the lady who tried to give him a home. It's a practice here to make tapes of the conversations with prospective parents. It saves confusion, possible embarrassment later, uh, if there's trouble... Oh, you're being taped right this minute, Mr. Carlin. I hope you don't mind. No, no, not at all. All right. Now, look, I I won't play it all for you. Just the part that concerns us now. (laughs) And and, and we did everything we could think of to make Bobby happy, Mrs. Appleton. He seemed happy. There wasn't any way we could guess that he didn't like it with us. And and then then to wake up one morning and, and, and he was gone. Simply gone. I'm sure you did everything you could. Oh, oh, we did. And he seemed to like us. Of course, he's he's naturally so sweet, so good. Except for the stealing. The what? The stealing? Oh, um, look, I I, I shouldn't call it stealing. Uh, We'd find little things missing. Little nothings. Once it was a frying pan... A wooden spoon one time. Oh, we found them later in his room. Once he took the belt from one of my dresses. A leather belt. Not that I cared. That's enough of that. But I should tell you, Bobby's been guilty of petty pilferage like that here at the orphanage. A hairbrush belonging to one of the teachers. And... Where, where did he go when he ran away? Well, the police found him that same night, wandering along a country road. There was a full moon. They had no trouble. And when the woman came to pick him up, he wouldn't talk to her. Wouldn't even see her. Didn't seem to hold anything against her. He just said, it was no use. No use? It's what he always says. You mean this has happened before? Several times during the last couple of years. Look, I'm telling you all this to let you know that if you take Bobby into your home, you're not getting the... Well... The usual child. No child is the usual child, Mrs. Appleton. 
Well, shall we go and have a talk with him, see how he feels about all this? By all means. Oh. Oh, I should tell you, Bobby's in confinement. You don't mean solitary He's confined to one room without lights or windows. I know that sounds severe, but... It does. We've tried everything else, even corporal punishment, though that's prohibited by law. It didn't do any good. He doesn't seem to feel it. How long has he been confined? Oh, nearly three weeks now. Mrs. Appleton, 24 days is supposed to be the limit before the victim goes mad. That's been established in prisons with grown men. Bobby's a boy. A most unusual boy. Shall we go talk to him? Please. This way. Uh, Mrs. Appleton, may I ask you, what is Bobby being punished for? What did he do? Oh, didn't I tell you? He ran away from the orphanage. That's the only thing he ever needs to be punished for, running away. Mrs. Appleton, when Bobby ran away from here, was it at night? Middle of the night, as near as we could tell. Oh, here we are. Was there a full moon that night? I don't recall. Does it matter? It might. Oh, here's my key. Bobby? It's Mrs. Appleton, Bobby. Yes, Mrs. Appleton. He's all right. You can come out now, Bobby. The door's open. Can you see? Yes, I can see, Mrs. Appleton. Does the light bother your eyes? Not very much. You remember Mr. Carlin, Bobby. It's nice to see you. I'm very well, Bobby. Thank you. I'm going back to the office now, and you two can have a nice talk. Thank you. You can join me there later, Mr. Carlin. Well, Bobby, I'm... I'm pleased you remember me. Didn't you mind being shut up in that dark room all by yourself for such a long time? Was it a long time? Three weeks. Is that a long time? What did you do all alone in there? Oh, I listened to the silence. Talked to the dark. I see. Would you like to come and stay with me and my wife for a while? See if you'll like it. We have a big house. A very big house? Well, pretty big. With servants? We have servants, yes. And beautiful gardens and a big green lawn. Well, does it matter if it's a big house with a lawn? A big white house. And servants, does that matter? I don't know. I thought it did. I could sort of see it. Well, what do you say? Would you like to visit with us for a while? I think I would. There's a good school nearby if you'd like to go. I'm tired of memorizing things. Well, whatever you say. Now, why don't you go pack some clothes and I'll go see Mrs. Appleton in her office and make the arrangements. Come in. Mrs. Appleton, that's a remarkable child. Oh, uh, close the door, will you, Mr. Carlin? Oh, yes. You've persuaded him? I'm convinced the reason Bobby can endure, even enjoy, three weeks of confinement is because he's able to hypnotize himself. And not only hypnotize himself, but put himself into a deep trance. Almost anyone can be hypnotized, but only one in 20 can hypnotize himself. And I've never heard of anyone who could put himself into a deep trance state. Well, supposing he can, what's the advantage of it? Why, it means that he can reach his unconscious mind. And perhaps unite it with his consciousness. A terribly difficult thing to do. And to do it alone, without any outside help, I... I never thought it was possible. Well, supposing he can do whatever it is you say he can, what of it? Mrs. Appleton, do you know what powers are locked in the unconscious? What forces, what instinctive knowledge, primitive memories? I've always thought of the subconscious as an untidy mass of very unpleasant emotions. It is untidy. But we've been taught the emotions are unpleasant because they lack morality and purpose, as indeed they do. Their only purpose being to express themselves. Most of us manage to live without expressing ourselves, Mr. Carl. Yes, but supposing you find one solitary human being who refuses to live that way. You mean Bobby. Well, Mr. Carlin, if he's willing to go with you and you want him, I've checked you out and everything's in order. 
Oh, one thing, Mr. Collin. I hope you're not going to talk to Bobby about his mother. Why not? Why shouldn't he talk about his mother if he wants to? Well, it's not really healthy in his case. He makes up outrageous stories about her. Such as what? Oh, that she was fantastically beautiful, that she married into royalty, a, a prince or a duke. Our children often fantasize that Last way. Last year he told us that she was a movie star, imagine. <laughs> Who was she really? Oh, just a poor, pathetic woman on relief. I found that out from our records. I wasn't here when she brought him. But that was six years ago. He was only four. The records say she simply couldn't afford to keep him. She's never been back? Never been back. Never called to see how he was getting along. Never sent him a present or even written him a note. Come in. Oh, Bobby. All packed to go home with Mr. Carlin? He has a big white house, Mrs. Appleton, with a big lawn and flowers and lots of servants. Haven't you, Mr. Carlin? Yes. I'm sorry about your wife. What? What about my wife? I'm sorry she's so unhappy. Didn't you tell me she's unhappy? And sick sometimes? I... I don't think I did. You must have. Or how would I know? Do we really know only what we've been told? Or what we've read? Or heard? I hate to believe that because then each of us is only a jumbled mass of information. And very often, we go about spreading this jumbled information for others to pick up and repeat. No wonder the world is in such a turmoil. If all we know is what we've been told by people who only know what they've been told, who only know what... Oh, no, no. No, there must be more. We can't go on this way. However... Having no solution at hand, I shall return shortly with Act Two. When one adopts a boy ten years old, it is not only the ten-year-old boy who has been taken into the new home... It is also the boy who was once nine, once eight, once seven, and so on. Clear back to the day an infant was born. And these early years are unknown, utterly unknown to the new parents. Just how unknown they are to the child is the subject of our story. We're almost there, Bobby. I know. You know? Well, I figured... You mean you felt it, that we were almost there? Something like that, I guess. Mental telepathy, maybe? What's that? Well, thought transference. I was thinking to myself, we're almost home, and the thought transferred itself to your mind. Is that what happened? I wasn't thinking about anything at all. It's when we're not thinking about anything at all that the thoughts of other people enter our minds. I'd like to think about that. Well? I think that's very true, what you said, Mr. Carlin. It's when you're not thinking about anything at all. That's when the good things happen. What good things, Bobby? Oh, all the good things. Mr. Carlin, you should have turned right there. No, no, that's Birch Tree Road. We live on a... You should have turned there. Go back. Now, Bobby, Bobby, take it easy. Go back. Bobby, I know where I live and I know how to get there. Your telepathy wasn't in good working order that time. Now, here is where we turn. To the left. We go about a quarter of a mile up this road, and then we're there. It's pretty. Is it what you expected? Kind of. It smells nice. You smell something? It smells sweet. Very, very sweet. I don't smell anything. Oh, we're coming to the privet hedge. That's the sweet smell. (laughs) Imagine you picking it up way back there. Now we're coming to the house. It is white. I told you it was. And there's a lawn in front with flowers. I told you there would be. Well, here we are. But it's not a very big house. It has 16 rooms. And where are all the servants? Did you sleep well in your new room, Bobby? Yes, I did. 
It's a very nice room. Nicer than the orphanage? That was nice. But this is nicer. This morning, Bobby, I, I want to take you to meet my wife. Her name is Anita, if you want to call her that. I think I should tell you she gets migraine headaches from time to time. I know. I knew she was sick sometimes. I think she's sick now. <laughs> no, she's not. I saw her this morning. She was fine. Come on, let's go upstairs. Okay. It's not very nice to be sick like that, is it? No, it certainly is not. I used to have asthma. That was terrible. What did you used to do about it? Oh, I made it stop. Made it stop? Just like that? Sort of. It was a long time ago. Here we are. Anita, may we come in, dear? Come on. Anita, this, this is Bobby. Go away, please. She's sick. My dear, is it another migraine? Please. I can't... Bobby, I can't. Bobby, we'd better come back later. She's sick. You'll meet her tomorrow. Come on. Mrs. Carlin, I'm here. I know how much it hurts, but I want you to know I'm here. And I want it to stop hurting. Please. Try to look at me, Mrs. Carlin. Bobby, don't. When, when she's like this, it's no use. I want you to give me your headache, Mrs. Carlin. Uh -huh. I want you to give it to me. Look, Mrs. Carlin. Anita, look. Give me your headache. I want to take it away from you. I'm going to take it away from you. Do you hear me? I'm going to take it. You're going to give it to me. I'm going to take it. Yes, I'm taking it. You're giving it to me. You're giving me your headache, aren't you? Yes, you are. I know you are. Please give it to me. All of it. Yes. Oh, please. Oh, oh yes. 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 All gone. Bobby? Bobby, where are you going? It, it, it's all right. All right. Bobby? I, I couldn't help Mr. Carlin. I, I had to throw up. Well, that, that's all right, son. That's all right. How is Mrs. Carlin? She says her headache is gone. Yes. Of course it's gone. She gave it to me. And how are you? I think I'm going to be all right pretty soon. I never knew before what a migraine headache was like. Now I know. Mrs. Appleton speaking. This is George Carlin, Mrs. Appleton. I've got great news for you. Everything's working out? Three weeks now and everything's going wonderfully. He seems very happy here and heaven knows he's made us happy. My wife hasn't had another headache since that time I wrote you about when Bobby cured her. Do you think he really did? Well, he did something to Mrs. Carlin. Perhaps he hypnotized her, I don't know. But her headache stopped. I was there. I saw it happen. Well, I have to take your word for it, Mr. Carlin. Uh, has he stolen anything that you know of? Uh, no, I, I don't think so. Well, you'd better check. There's a belt of mine missing, but I'm sure I must have mislaid it. Look in his room. No, I wouldn't dream of doing that. The boy is happy here, and we're happy having him here. Has he talked about his mother? No, he hasn't mentioned her. Well, my advice is to keep it that way. I don't think I agree with that, Mrs. Appleton. You know what I told you. All you'll get from him is a lot of wild fantasy. At this point, I feel I'd like to hear anything Bobby cares to tell me. Well, if you don't want to take my advice... No, it's not I... that, Mrs. Appleton. It's that for the time being, I'd sort of like to follow my own instincts... You understand? I suppose so. I'll keep in touch with you. Please do, and good luck to you. Thank you. Oh, Bobby, I, I didn't hear you come in. Uh, that was Mrs. Appleton I was talking to on the phone. How is she? She's fine. Do you miss her? Not too much. Bobby, you know that black-tooled leather belt of mine? Yes, I know that belt. I can't find it. Have you seen it? It's in my room. Well, did I leave it there, do you think? I don't know. I don't think so. By any chance, Bobby, 
Did you take it out of my room? I think... I guess I did. I'm pretty sure I did. You want me to go get it? Oh, you can have it if you really want it. Only I'd rather you'd ask me instead of just taking it. But I don't want it. No? It's too big for me. Why would I want it? I, I don't know. I just saw it and it reminded me of something. Reminded you of what? I was going to give it back to you. I didn't mean to keep it. I didn't even want it. All right, all right now. It's all right. Just put it back in my room when you get a chance, will you? I'll put it right back now. Now in the morning will be all right. Bobby, do you ever feel you want to talk to me about your mother? My mother? Do you remember her at all? I know you were only four when she left you at the orphanage. She was very, very beautiful. What else? I'm not supposed to talk about my mother. Well, don't you want to? Not now, Mr. Carlin. All right. But if you ever want to, I'm here, you know. I know. Uh, George? George? Hmm? Oh, what are you doing up? Can't you sleep? Not for hours. Oh, the moon is so bright. I don't wonder. No, it's not just the moon. I I was thinking about Bobby. Oh, funny. I was thinking about him, too. I talked to Mrs. Appleton this afternoon. She asked me, did Bobby ever talk about his mother? He never does. That's what I told her. And she said, fine, keep it that way. But I said I didn't agree, that I thought he should talk about whatever he felt like talking about. Oh, you're absolutely right. Bobby came into the room about that time, and I brought up the subject of his mother. And all he'd say was, she was very, very, very beautiful. That's all? I tried to get him to go on, but he just clammed up, said I'm not supposed to talk about her. Mrs. Appleton probably told him not to. She has a point in a way. She says Bobby makes up wild stories about his mother, whom he hasn't seen or even heard from in six years. You mean since he was four? That's right. But he tells people, or used to, that she had dozens of admirers, finally married some title gen, became a movie star. Oh, George. Our children often do that. Another thing, Mrs. Appleton asked me if Bobby had snitched anything. And I told her about my black-tooled leather belt. Then when Bobby came in, I asked him if he'd seen it, and right away he said yes, it was in his room. Really? I asked him if he'd taken it, and he said he guessed he must have. Did I want it back? It was too big for him anyway. Well, isn't that peculiar? You know, I told you the woman who took him last year said he snitched silly things. A frying pan, a wooden spoon, a belt off one of her dresses. Oh. Now, I wonder if that's where our little frying pan disappeared to. They were asking me in the kitchen if I'd seen it. What, there's a frying pan missing? Heavens, George. We, we have about 12 frying pans of assorted sizes. Is there anything else missing? No, nothing else. Oh. Well, unless you want to say one of my shoes is missing. One of your shoes? Those high-heeled things. I, I've given up high heels, and I put those out to give away. And next time I looked, there was only one. It must have gotten thrown out. Goodness, it would take one shoe. Who would throw away one shoe? Oh, George. <laughs> Look, come on back to bed. Maybe you can get to sleep. Yeah, maybe. That damn moon wasn't so bright. It shines right across the bed. Why don't you pull the curtains? You know what? It's a full moon. Well, pull the curtains and, and come to bed. <sighs> can you see or do you want a light on? Oh, I can see. What was that? What was what? Did you hear a door close? What door? It sounded like downstairs. There he goes. Bobby? Yes, and there's a full moon. Oh, George. Like before. Call him back. Go after him, George. No. No, I don't think I'm going to do that. Well, for heaven's sakes, why not? You can't just let him go wandering around all by himself. No, I don't think he's going to be just wandering around. You think he's going someplace in particular? Yes. Where? I don't know. And I don't think he knows either. But someplace. <laughs> As we are all going someplace, we don't know where, 
and there is no one who knows to tell us where. Yet very deep in our minds, or our hearts, or our tormented souls, we know we are going someplace. We can't see ahead, and it does no good to look back. We can only trudge on down the road to someplace. I'll be back shortly with Act Three. The temperature in downtown Chicago, 88 degrees. Officially at Midway, 85. This is WBBM Chicago. The full moon with which Act Two ended has been wiped out now by the exploratory colors of the rising sun. And steadily down a winding road trudges a small boy, ten years of age, steadily, purposefully, toward a destination he could not name were you to ask him. It is Bobby Deland. The thin little boy's arms start to wave wildly as a truck approaches. What's up, kid? Could you give me a lift? How far are you going? I don't know exactly. Down the road a ways. Come on. Get in. Here, let me give you a hand. That's a pretty big step up. I can do it. What you doing out at this hour? It's hardly daylight. I have to go see somebody. You expected? Uh, yes, I'm expected. I didn't say when, though. Going to see your folks? My mother... And I guess you know where she's at. Somewhere along this road. No number? No name? Like on a mailbox? I'll know when we get there. You've been there before, I guess. It's a great big white house with a big green lawn and flowers. I think I know the place she means. And lots and lots of servants. Yeah. There it is. There it is. See? Right there. Stop. I want to get out. Stop the truck. I'll stop. And it don't jump. Hold on, I'm stopping. Now, wait a second, kid. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Hey, you hadn't ought to go in there. Hey, you know what you're doing? You hadn't ought to... Baroness, under this tree. Is that all right? I'll fetch you some coffee and I'll be right back. Excuse me, are you my mother's maid? <laughs> yes, yes, I am. Will you tell her I've come to see her, please? If she... If she feels well enough to see me. What's your name? Bobby Deland. Would you tell my mother? And how did you get in here, Bobby? Somebody dropped me off before. I've been waiting till I saw the servants come out of the house. Now, please, I'd like to see my mother. You mean that lady over there? Yes, my mother. Oh, I'm afraid that's not your mother, dear. That's the Baroness Hortha. Well, her name before was Mrs. Dillon. Please tell her I want to see her. Oh, never mind. I'll oh, hold on now. Now, just a minute. Let go. Let me Not go. so fast, young man. Let go of me. Miss Copeland, what's going on? Oh, it's this boy. He wandered in here. He wants to talk to the Baroness. He's her son, he says. Well, then let him. Should I, Doctor? Why not? He may succeed where we failed. Go ahead, my boy. Thank you. Hello, Mother. I'm here. <laughs> Uh, hello, Mrs. Appleton? George Carlin. I wanted to tell you Bobby's been found. Thank you for not calling the police. Well, you know, I told you I saw him leave the house. I simply followed him in my car. It wasn't hard, so don't worry. What's that? Well, and I, I don't think that's necessary, but if you want to... 
Look, can't you tell me over the phone? Well, all right. No, no, I'm not at home. I'm at the place where I found Bobby. It's on Birch Tree Road, not too far from where I live. A big white house, very big, big lawn out in front. It's the Wesley Sanitarium. You know it? Well, I'm with Dr. Wesley right now. All right, we'll expect you. Mrs. Appleton's coming over, if that's all right, Doctor. Perfectly all right. She wants to tell me something, show me something. I, I don't know what. Tell me, Mr. Carlin, what made you think Bobby might come here? It was just a guess. But when I brought him home from the orphanage, he wanted to turn onto Birch Tree Road. Did he say why? He thought it was the road my house is on. Not that it had ever been at my house. All he knew about my house was that it was big and white, had a lawn with flowers and servants. He knew that because I told him. And I told him because he specifically asked. It seemed important to him, did it? Very. I was puzzled at that because he's not a snobbish sort of boy. Quite the contrary. That insistence on a lot of servants. Now I begin to understand. Your sanitarium does have a lot of servants. As well as a lawn and flowers. But the boy's never seen the sanitarium, has he? He hasn't even seen his mother since the age of four. Then how would he know? I suppose that when you think about, dream about a certain person for such a long time and fantasize about that person the way he did about his mother... What sort of fantasies? Oh, wild ones. That she was much admired, much sought after, that she married into royalty, became a movie oh, star. Oh, uh, hold on there. She did marry into royalty. You don't mean she's... Really a baroness? Yes, indeed. The Baroness Hawthor. Well, I thought that baroness stuff was, you know, part of her dementia. The Baron brought her here. The Baron pays her bills. He's not very high up in the royal lists, but he's a Baron, nevertheless. The boy couldn't have known that. No more than he could have known Birch Tree Road. Now, about her becoming a movie star... Uh, the Baron told us that she made a motion picture a few years ago. Uh, actually, that's where he met her. He put up the money. She starred in it. Well, that's impossible, isn't it? Someone would, would have known, seen the picture, recognized her. I don't know who saw the picture, Mr. Carlin. It was a pornographic film. No. The Baron has made a good bit of money on pornographic films, I'm told. She made the film? Starred in it. She married the Baron? He's devoted to her. Well, then what happened? Oh, about a year ago, she became uh, uh, severely depressed. It, it went further into melancholia. Finally, she became very nearly catatonic, and he brought her here. She won't talk to him when he comes to see her, as she's never spoken to any of us. It was about a year ago, as I understand it, that Bobby began to talk about a big white house with a lawn and gardens and a lot of servants. Could he have known that she'd been brought here? To a place he'd never seen, didn't even know existed? It's a rare person who has a faculty uh, to sense what is going on. But if there is a great affinity between two people, I suppose a telepathic communication is... Well, it's possible. Was there such an affinity between Bobby and his mother? After all, she abandoned him when he was four and never communicated with him after that. Communicated with him? I'd say by all the evidence she communicated with him the whole time they were apart. She may not have known she was communicating, but her son was, on the face of it, so sensitively attuned to her and her existence, he could pick up waves that emanated from her that she knew nothing about. Uh, come in. Dr. Wesley, I hope I did the right thing. Oh, what's that? Well, I left the little boy with the Baroness. Is that all right? I think so. The Baroness has never shown the slightest sign of being violent. Uh, quite the contrary. Well, she does seem interested in him. I mean, she looks at him. Sounds like progress to me. So then I should just leave them together? Where are they? In her room. I'd say leave them together. Uh, but leave the door open. Yes, Doctor. Mm. It will be astounding if she recognizes him, accepts him. It could mean she's on her way back. Dr. Wesley, this, this faculty you talk about, this rare ability to sense things, what is it? It doesn't have a name. 
Uh, anyway, not a name that appears in scientific journals, but some clairvoyants have it, some mystics have it, some saints, I suppose, many poets have it. It's an ability to reach far into oneself, to make contact. Do you know the poem called The Labyrinth? W.H. Auden wrote it. There are four lines from it that I quote to myself all the time. The center that I cannot find is known to my unconscious mind. I have no reason to despair because I am already there. Nice, isn't it? What what does it mean? Oh, come, come, Mr. Carlin. You know very well what it means. That if we only go deep enough into ourselves, we will find the center that will that will stabilize us? Is that it? Give us peace? Is that it? The peace that passeth all understanding. Because I'm afraid understanding has very little to do with it. To think that a four-year-old boy could hold fast to the image of his mother through all those years. What else had he to hold fast to? And then find her by his own effort. Which only proves again, Mr. Carlin, we get what we want if we want it enough. Uh, uh, come in. Uh, Mrs. Appleton. I got here as soon as I could. Uh, Mrs. Appleton, Dr. Wesley. Please sit down, Mrs. Appleton. Oh, thank you, Doctor. Now, the boy's all right, Mrs. Appleton. You're not to worry. He's with his mother. His mother? He found her here, Mrs. Appleton. She's the reason for his running away all those times. <sighs> Mr. Collin, Dr. Wesley, I've brought something to show you. Something for you to hear. And what is that? Well, when you called me last night, Mr. Collin, I was so upset. Everything had been going so well, and then to have him run away again. Uh, anyway, I couldn't get back to sleep. So I went down to the basement, and I rummaged around among the old files, and I found this. A, a tape? Yes. We keep tapes at the orphanage of all the interviews we have with prospective parents and with the people who leave their children for adoption. Well... This tape, this one goes back six years before I came to the orphanage. And it's a tape of... Oh, is it all right if I use this machine, Doctor? Oh, yes, go right ahead. All right. Now, I'll, I'll just play you the part towards the end. It's the tape they had running when Mrs. Dealand came to leave Bobby. You gotta take him or I'll, I'll kill him. Look... I, I'm a cheap prostitute. I live in one room. I have to send the kid out to play in the street while I'm conducting my business. Now, how long can I go on telling him? It's his Uncle Charlie I got up in my room. And another thing, I, I, I haven't got the greatest disposition in the world. And when I'm hungover, when my head hurts, I go crazy and, I, and I'm liable to, to hit him. And... Let's just hit him. I'll hit him with anything that's handy. Yesterday, I hit him with my shoe. With a heel. My shoe. A spike heel. I... And it doesn't have to be a shoe. I'll, I'll think of anything and hit him with it. It's a flying pad. It's a belt on my chest. Anything that's handy. <laughs> well... I wanted you to hear that, Mr. Carlin, because you said that Bobby had taken a belt at your house and the woman last year said he took a frying pan. He took a shoe of my wife's. I think we'd better go see if everything's all right. Uh, come with me. He's right down the hall. How in the world did his mother come to be here? It's a long story, Mrs. Appleton. Oh. How did he know she was here? That's an even longer story. Here we are. Is he in there with her? Yes. Be quiet. I brought you some presents, Mother. Look. Here's a belt. And here's a frying pan. 
And here's a shoe. See, Mother? They're for you. With my love. Mothers of the world, rejoice, for you are loved. Of course, in the human nature of things, you are simultaneously hated and by the same person. For no emotion as powerful as love can flourish unadulterated. Side by side with love goes hate. It is, you might say, a package deal. I'll be back shortly. lived within ourselves? The posturing we do in full view of others, what is that but the antic behavior of a poor clown who needs to be applauded? The exterior life is really only incidental, yet we expend all our energy on it, while the interior life is left to its own devices, as though deeply ashamed of it. We wish to disown it. Our cast included Michael Tolan, Marion Seldes, Martha Greenhouse, Hetty Galen, and Gilbert Mack. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division, the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg Special K cereal, and new sugar-free diet 7-Up. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. I'm E.G. Marshall. Welcome to the shadowy land of the imagination, where all things are possible. Would you believe that a husband and wife could look at the same woman, and the wife would see her as an old lady, almost in her dotage, while the husband sees a beautiful woman in her early 30s? Impossible, you say? Of course, Ray. You know I'm going to bewitch you. You've been trying, haven't you? Well, only half-heartedly. Remember, you're married. I never forget it for a moment. You're the one who seems to want to forget it. You won't even meet my wife. <laughs> well, of course I will. Let's all attend a witch's Sabbath together. You, your wife, and I, your favorite witch. You almost make me believe you're serious, Clarissa. <laughs> Dare to make the date. And then you find out. I'd love to see you at a witch's Sabbath. Our mystery drama, The Young Die Good, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Murray Burnett and stars Patricia Elliott and Carol Titel. It is sponsored in part by... New sugar-free diet, 7-Up, and Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. (laughs) 
I've never been able to figure out why it's customary to tie strings of empty tin cans to the car of newlyweds. What do the empty cans signify? I can't go along with the cynic who suggested that the cans symbolize the extent of home-cooked meals that the poor groom is going to get for the remainder of his lifetime. I know for a fact that this wasn't true of the young newlyweds we're about to meet, Lisa and Ray Bissonette. Lisa happened to be a good enough cook to be able to win prizes. And on the day our story opens, she'd left a roast in the oven while she went out and explored the small grounds of the Bissonette's little dream house. A high hedge ran alongside the driveway that separated the Bissonette house from their neighbor. And Lisa, with the curiosity that all daughters of Eve have had since the Garden of Eden, poked her head through an opening in the hedge. Hello there. Come on through and get acquainted. Hello. I'm Lisa Bissonette. I'm your new neighbor. I'm Clarice Wenderby. It's good to see young people next door again. I hope you and your husband will be very happy. Thank you. Have you lived here long? Well, I was here before your house was built. Of course, my husband was alive then. And now you're alone? Yes. And happy to see you. You're welcome to drop in any time, child. I'd be glad of the company. That's very neighborly, and I'll return the invitation. Oh, but I have to run now. Take a look at my roast. I expect my husband in less than an hour. Hi there, neighbor. Oh, hi. I'm Ray Bissonnette. Well, I'm Clarissa Jaffe. Can I offer you a cocktail before dinner? Oh, it sounds delightful, but my uh, wife's expecting me. She heard me drive up and... Oh, uh... say no more. Just remember, you have a rain check any time. I'll remember. Thanks. It's nice to have neighbors again. Be seeing you. Welcome, my lord and master, to go home and castle. Hey there, doll. Don't let women's lib hear that greeting. You know I didn't mean it. You didn't? Just the welcome part. Hey, something <laughs> smells delicious. And yours was the second welcome I got since I came home. Oh? You can say that again. The dish who lives next door was at that hedge opening in the driveway and asked me in for a drink. <laughs> That's why we're married, <laughs> darling. I love you and your sense of humor. What's so funny? <laughs> she really did ask me. I'm sure she did, darling. She's a lonely old lady. Oh, I'm sorry to spoil your little game, because I saw her earlier this afternoon, and you can't hope to make me jealous of a woman in her 80s. Well, I don't know what woman you saw, Lisa. But the lady who spoke to me wasn't anywhere near 30, let alone 80. <laughs> I know what I saw and who I saw. Well, I'm sure you saw what you told me, honey, but... Well, at least give me the same break you asked for yourself. I know what I saw, too. <laughs> but it's crazy. Well... There's probably some simple explanation. I'll bet there is. And I'm the one who's going to get it from Mrs. Wenderby the, the first thing tomorrow morning. Lisa, how nice of you to come visiting so soon and so early. Would you like a cup of coffee? Coffee would be nice. Well... Let's go into the kitchen. I always find it cozier. Do you take cream and sugar? Just black, thank you. Tell me, are you getting used to the neighborhood? Do you find the shopping center exciting? As a matter of fact, yes. But if you don't... Well, I get out so infrequently. There used to be a farmer's market on Duane Street that had the loveliest, freshest vegetables. Duane Street? is just one block past the station. Of course, you don't meet your husband at the train, so... My husband's really the reason I came over. Oh, how interesting. You didn't meet him yesterday, did you? Did he say he did? <laughs> Well, he said he met a beautiful 30-year-old woman. Here? In my house? Who's the woman my husband saw last night? Oh, my dear child, don't tell me you're jealous. <laughs> Goodbye, Mrs. Wenderby. I'm sorry I bothered you. Please, please, please don't go. I'll try to help you. Why should it be so difficult? 
there's something here I don't understand, and I'm going to get to the bottom of it. It, it might be best if you move. What? It really might be best. That's ridiculous. Well, do you know what you're saying? Yes. But Ray and I looked for a house for almost six months. We could never find a house like this at the price we paid. I know. Perhaps you'll do well to find out why this house went so cheaply. Hi, neighbor. I'm glad you decided to pick up your rain check on that drink so quickly. Uh, no drink, thanks. Oh, come in anyway. It's only neighborly. Uh, about... I left the office early today, just, just to straighten something out. This shouldn't really take more than a minute. <laughs> Are you afraid of me? Sit down. Oh, oh, thank you. Uh, it may sound silly, but last night my wife and I got into a ridiculous argument. Oh, not over me. Yes, you see, Lisa says you're an old lady. Well, how could she since we've never met? Well, that's what I told her. But she insists she was here before me yesterday and spoke with an old lady who said she lived here. Oh, now I understand. What a silly, silly mistake. The old lady your wife met is my mother, Therese Wenderby. Your mother lives with you? But not all the time. But she's here a good deal. My husband's wonderful about it. Well, Lisa told me she was very definite about saying she lived here alone. <laughs> well, now you know that isn't so, don't you, Ray? I know, but... Well, how do I convince Lisa? Well, being a woman, I think Lisa will understand when... You tell her my mother's vain. Vain? <laughs> yes, as ridiculous as it sounds for a woman her age. She just hates to admit that she has a daughter my age. Oh, I find that hard to believe. Are, um, either of your parents living, Ray? My dad. He's, uh, 68. Well, you find that the older a person gets, the more childish their behavior can become. Now, I'm glad... You said can, because I don't think my dad is... <laughs> well, a... let's, hope, let's hope not. But uh, can you understand why my mother lied to your wife? N -n no, not completely, but at least I'll be able to calm Lisa down. No, no, no. It's the most ridiculous story I've ever heard. But, darling, I tell you that I... I know what you tell me. You've been telling me for the past half hour. And I tell you it's nonsense. Did you ask to see her mother? It never occurred to me. Why not? Well, I... I you I, didn't take my word seriously enough to question this beautiful dame you say lives next door. That's why not. Oh, now, Lisa, I, I mean, I, I... I can't know why you're making this personal. I believe you. I believe you met and spoke with an 83-year-old woman who said she lived in the house next door. Alone. Alone. Now, why won't you believe that this woman is the mother of the young woman who spoke with me? Because Mrs. Winderby said she didn't have a daughter. But I've already explained that. And I don't buy it. For the hundredth time, why not? Because when I spoke to Mrs. Winderby today and told her your story about meeting the young lady... What do you think she said to me? I can't imagine. She told me to move. Move out of this house. Well, that proves it. The old girl is slightly batty. Oh, I know how to settle this. We're going over there, the two of us, and straighten this out once and for all. <laughs> well, it is possible that they're afraid to answer the door. That's not possible. But it is possible that no one's home. You said you were just talking to her. I think we've been arguing at least 15 minutes. She, she could have gone out during that time. But there are lights upstairs. Well, some people leave lights on when they go out because they're afraid that an unlighted house is an invitation to a burglar. I can't understand why you're so dead set against admitting that for some reason she doesn't want to meet me. And I can't understand why we're standing outside an obviously empty house ringing a doorbell when we could go back to our place. <sighs> I'm sorry, Ray. It's okay. I don't know what's happening to us. Well, I guess I should say what's happening to me. 
I'm behaving like all the wives I've hated all my life. Oh, forget it, love. Ray. Hmm? Why was this house such a good buy? What? Mrs. Wenderby told me to ask you why we got this house so cheap. Oh, I thought we were going to stay off this subject. I just want a simple answer to a simple question. Is that really all you're asking? Yes. Why won't you answer me? Well, I... I have my reasons. I'm sure you have. And I guess it's because of the attractiveness of that 30-year-old woman you say lives next door. Why, you're jealous. That's what this whole thing is about. You're jealous. Don't be ridiculous. <laughs> For Pete's sake, Lisa, the reason I don't want to tell you is... Well, it's because I'm afraid you'll get upset. I'll be more upset if you don't tell me. Okay. Superstitious people around here think there's some kind of jinx on this house. Jinx? It's silly, but there you are. Why? Why do they think there's a jinx? Something about the last two couples who lived here. Both husbands are dead. They died under peculiar... I don't know. Don't worry about it. It's, it's all a lot of nonsense. How did they die, Ray? I don't know. Nobody knows. They just disappeared. Disappearing husbands have always been a problem to the wives they leave behind. And houses with a reputation for bringing tragedy to families that dwell in them have always been a problem to those who want to dispose of them. Behind both problems, there's always a reason. And that's what Lisa Bissonette intends to discover when I return shortly with Act Two. Today's civilization is replete with problem solvers of various kinds. We have our priests, ministers, rabbis, and gurus, and we have the psychoanalysts, the newspaper columnists, the palm readers, soothsayers, and astrologists, all doing their best to clear up the riddles of the living. Some strong-minded people prefer to do their own problem solving. Ray Bissonette was one of these. And he faced his problem by coming home early, leaving his car around the corner, and walking across the lawn of the house next door to his. Hi there, neighbor. You look like a man with a problem. All right, you are. Can I help? You bet. Because you're the problem. Oh, don't tell me it's your wife and my mother again. That's exactly what it is, and I'd be grateful if you just walk across to my house with me right now and let me introduce you to Lisa. Well, of course. You will? Well, you sound surprised. Well, forgive me, but this thing has Lisa so uptight, I I guess some of her nonsense has rubbed off on me. Well, what seems to be bothering her? Is she jealous? It's hard to tell. She finds the situation strange. Oh! What happened? Oh! Oh! It's my ankle. Oh. I, I, I turned it in this hole. I told Harry we've got to do something about the moles. They, they tunnel everywhere. Can you walk? I, I, I'll try it. Would you let me lean on you? Oh, oh, oh. Oh, no, 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 no. This is oh. no good. Let me oh. carry you. Well, I, I'm certainly not going to meet your wife with you carrying No, me. I'll, I'll take oh. you back to your place. Uh. Just uh, oh. put your hand around my neck. Oh. You want the uh, couch or the chair? Well, I think the couch, if you don't mind. I, I can put my foot up. Uh, there you are. Oh, Anything I can get you? Oh, no. No, thanks. And, oh, Ray, I, I, I'm truly sorry. Oh, accidents happen. Are you angry? Oh, no. No, it was an accident. You should be. Why? Well, isn't it obvious? You and your pretty wife are quarreling, and I'm the cause. Oh, it'll pass. Ray, do you find me... Fascinating. Uh, interesting. <laughs> but not irresistible. Oh, come on, Clarissa. What are you trying to do? Find out if I'm attractive to you. You know you are. Good. That makes me happy. 
Just knowing that I'm still attractive. Hey, you talk like an old lady. <laughs> well, women are funny. I wish I could tell when you're leveling. You will when you get to know me better. Well, that's not going to be until Lisa meets you. I promise you that we'll meet. Uh, when? I don't know, but... Hey, uh, how about you and Harry getting together with us for an evening? Maybe uh, dinner and the show. Well, I'd love it, but... Well, Harry's really pretty much of a stick in the mud. Oh, I'm sure you can talk him into going out with us. Well, I'll try. How about uh, this Saturday? Well, you must prove to your pretty wife that there really is a Clarissa. That's one reason. I'll try to get Harry to go along. Where shall we meet? Well, if you don't hear from me, um, let's make it Theodore. Okay. The food is good, the lights are low, and the music romantic. <laughs> Dear Clarissa and Harry are almost one hour late. I guess so, but, well, relax. This is a lovely restaurant. We can have another cocktail. No, thank you. I'm sure they'll be here any minute. Why am I sure they won't be? Darling, I spoke with Clarissa this morning. It's just inconceivable they won't show. After all, we're neighbors. There's no reason for them. Mr. Bissonnette. Yes. Telephone for you, sir. Shall I bring it to your table? I'll see you at home, Ray. Hey, now, wait a minute, I've Lisa. waited too long as it is. Both of us know what that phone call means, and I've had it. If you want to talk to me, you can reach me at home. And if you're not at home in an hour, don't bother to come at all. Here's your phone, sir. Oh, thank you. Well? Oh, Ray, darling, I don't know how to tell you this, but... Uh, you, you can't make it. Yes, that's right. Harry came down with this miserable... Well, I, I don't know, I guess it's a 24-hour virus or something, and it just... Well, look, let, let's make it another time. Oh, we... no, that's out of the question now, Clarissa. It's... It's been strange knowing you, but uh, we'd better forget the whole thing. Why, Lisa, child, what brings you here at this time of night? Your sick son-in-law, Harry. I thought maybe he'd like... Harry? Sick. Isn't he? No, not that I know of. At least we're getting somewhere. You admit that you have a daughter and a son-in-law. Well, come in, child. All right. Now, perhaps you'll tell me why your daughter, Clarissa, doesn't want to meet me. Did you, um, find out why your house was such a bargain? Yes. And you're still not thinking of moving? I want to see your daughter. There's no way you can. Unless you're willing to take my advice. Are you trying to fight me? I am trying to help you. Believe me, my child, I'm trying to help you. And I should know better. What's that thunder? I'm afraid we're in for a storm. You'd best be getting back to your house. But you still haven't told I've me what I... have done more than I should. Now take my advice. And take your handsome young husband and move out of that house. My dear Mrs. Bissonnette, I understand a little bit of what you're trying to tell me. But I still don't understand how you found me. Professor Cooper, I told you. I was looking at these books on witchcraft in the library, and I came across your name several times. And everyone seems to agree that you're the foremost authority on witches. So I checked with the publishers, and they gave me your address. And uh, what is it you want me to do? Tell my husband that at least there is the possibility that, well, that something very strange is going on at the house next door. I couldn't possibly do that, Mrs. Bissonnette. Not until I've done some investigating on my own. Oh, would you, Professor? I'll pay, I'll pay whatever you... It's not a question of money. It's time, of which I have very little. But if what you say is true... This might be very productive for my research for a book I'm doing on witchcraft now. I'll check it out. This is my husband, uh, Professor Linus Cooper. Uh, pleased to meet you. Professor, please tell him what's happening next door. I'm not exactly sure what's happening, but I have gathered enough evidence to make me suspicious and worried. 
What do you call evidence, Professor? I called at the house yesterday, and I saw the 80-year-old lady. Oh, that doesn't prove anything. And no one else. However, I am going to make one further test. Uh, Mrs. Bissonnette, uh, tell me, do you remember seeing any clocks in the house when you visited? I really can't say. I was only in the kitchen and walked through the living room. What's all this about clocks? Just this. I intend to get back into that house somehow in the next few days and explore it thoroughly. And if I find that there are no clocks in the house... What? I should then advise you to move, Mr. Bissonette, and move fast. <laughs> Very Bissonette. Please, please don't hang up. Oh, Clarissa, I'm very busy, really. I, just... I know. I apologize for calling you at your office, but I just have to explain. No, I've told you that it's Please, far... please meet me for lunch today. The musical program at Whitley's, any time at your convenience. Now, one condition. That you promise to meet Lisa and talk with her. I can't go into that again, not on the phone. What time? One thirty. It's less crowded, then. <laughs> just hope I'm not making another mistake. Well, I'm the one who made the mistake, thinking I could play this crazy game. I don't understand. But there is no Harry. That's why I couldn't meet you and Lisa last night. You mean you're not married? Divorced. You see, there was a no, Harry. Then why did you... Like yes. you? Well, because I... I like you. Well, that explains everything. You like a guy, so you lie to him. Well, you do if you're a divorcee and you want to see him again without... Well, without problems. You're still not making sense. Maybe this lunch wasn't such a good idea after all. Because when I tell you about my mother, it's going to sound like something out of a, a confession magazine. Try me. Well, my mother... Uh, why is it so hard for me to say this? My mother isn't well. You mean there's something wrong with her physically? No, no, no. She's old and she gets... Well, you know how some old people get. So now... A little more than that. As a matter of fact, the doctor has told me to institutionalize her, but I just can't. I, I, I oh. won't. Okay. I understand your problem, and even why you don't want to solve it by sending your mother away, but can't you understand mine? Of course, Ray. And I promise to do something about it. All you have to do is meet Lisa and explain it to her. And you also ought to tell your mother to quit telling people horror stories and scaring the wits out of them. I'm home, Clarice. I'm home. And I'm alone. And I must talk to you. I know. Then you must know what I want to talk to you about. Of course. Please, be kind. How can I be anything else? Aren't we one and the same, just an older and a younger version of the same woman? That's why I know how angry you are, and it's all so, so, so useless somehow. Useless? Then why don't you appear, Clarice, before Ray? Let him see the old woman. For the same reason you don't meet Lisa and show her the young woman. Right, Clarice. You remember our bargain with him, our master. I only have so much of the energy. And it must be reserved for the young men whom we need to stay young. And I talk to the young women. But, Clarissa, this one, I like. And you frightened her, Clarice. You scared her so much she went and talked to our old friend. Who do you mean? Professor Linus Cooper. And do you know what he's been talking about, Clarice? No, 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 leave me alone. 
He has been asking about clocks. He wants to know if there are any clocks in our house. Clocks to tell the passage of time. You know what clocks are, you old fool. Oh, please, please. And he is going to come here and he's going to look around unless... unless I stop him. That's very strange. I'd have sworn the house was right around the corner. Now let's see that street sign. Yes, Green Tree Lane. That was the name of the street. I'll just drive over the hill and turn the corner and... Hey, look out, you fool! Watch it! Did that... Was that the sound of a car crash? I don't think Professor Cooper will come visiting. I'm too old. Too old, Clarissa. And too tired. I know all about it, Clarice. I know how old you are. And silly. And soft. You told Lisa Bissonette to move, although you knew very well that her nice young husband would move with her, didn't you, Clarice? I've told you, Clarissa, I'm very old and very, very tired. Just remember, you'll be a lot older and a lot more tired if Ray Bissonette moves away. You, Clarice, might even be dead. From our first arithmetic class, we're taught that one and one make two, two and two make four, and so on. Until today, we're living in the computer society where giant adding machines solve all our problems for us. However, our minds would boggle and the computer would break down in a world where one and one made only one. I'll explain that strange arithmetic when I return shortly with Act Three. Jealousy is one characteristic that is just as prevalent among males as females. Jealous feelings often conceal themselves behind other facades, and Ray Bissonette is convinced that his wife, Lisa, is overreacting to their somewhat eccentric neighbors because she's jealous of the lady next door. Lisa's willing to admit there may be some truth in that, but she's also convinced there's a lot more to it than jealousy, even though she can't put a name to it. There's something so very wrong. I know it. I feel it in my bones. It just doesn't justify our giving up this house and paying a lot more for something nowhere near as nice. And what about Professor Cooper? Are you going to try and blame an automobile accident on Clarissa? Clarissa's just a name. I still haven't met her. And you know why not. Would you please, please listen to Clarice? Why should I listen to an old lady who would be in an institution except for the kindness of her daughter? You believe that? Why not? A lot of old people get funny ideas. Mm, particularly when they live right next door to a house from which two young men have disappeared in the last year and a half. Why, honey, you're really scared. Yes. Yes, you big lug, I am. Okay. Short of packing up and moving us out of here, what can I do to unscare you? Listen to Clarice when you meet her. And when will that be? As soon as I can arrange it. I see your little lady friend from next door is coming to visit, Clarice. And I must say, I'm glad to get a chance to rest. It's quite tiring for me. I know, Clarissa. I know. Now remember, we need Ray Bissonette. I know that too. I'm even more tired than you, Clarissa. Much more. Oh, 
I'm so glad you're home, Mrs. Wenderby. I have a lot that well, I want to... why don't you just come in and have some tea? I was just making myself a cup. Oh, uh, thank you. Uh, you don't mind the kitchen? Oh, not at all. My dear, what is it you want from me? I think you should come with me to my house and tell Ray what you told me. Do you think your husband will move out because I tell him he should? You're very wise. And forgive me, but, but very strange, too. Just very old. You don't think about growing old, do you? Well, well, I... of course not. You're too young and too alive. You're not worried about the lines and the wrinkles. You wouldn't look for some way, for any way, to stay young forever. Now, come on, baby. This is the 20th century, the atomic age, the computer-controlled society. Don't give me this stuff about witches. How else can you explain what's been going on? I wish you'd tell me just what you think has been going on. Ray, why is it that I only see Mrs. Wendeby and you only see Clarissa? I don't know. It's because you're a man and I'm a woman. Why should that make a difference? If they both were the same woman, it would make all the difference in the world, wouldn't it? Do you know what you're saying? Yes. Well, where in the world did you ever get a nutty idea like that? From these books. Then I suggest you stop reading them. Stick with the comics. They make more sense. You see, the succubi are really frighteningly ugly, but to young men they appear beautiful and desirable. I can't believe you'd take all this witch and succubi stuff seriously. Two men who lived in this house before us disappeared. The only thing about that that bothers me is that it bothers you. If you're really concerned about me... There is something you can do. Well, if you mean move out, the answer... I mean put my theory to the test. How are we going to do that? You make one last date with Clarissa. Whoa! Hear me out. Just for lunch or cocktail or coffee. You tell me when and where. I'll happen along and you'll introduce me. After I meet her, I'll give you my word. I'll never mention witches or moving again. <laughs> Clarissa, but I, I don't think I'm late. Well, you're right on the dot. Honestly, Ray, I was so excited when you called. I, I just couldn't wait to, to see you. My wife asked me to call you. Well, I find that fascinating. She's really bugged about never having met you, and she's getting all kinds of crazy ideas about you and your mother, and I'm, I'm really worried. Well, of course you are. I will have you and your wife at my house for cocktails tomorrow, around 5.30. Great. But um, only on the condition that you come alone on the following day for tea. I hate tea. Oh, but you haven't tasted my brew. But I... And uh, you also promise to look deeply into my eyes when you drink. You're putting me on. I was never more serious in my life. And uh, now, if you'll excuse me. Oh, but I wanted to tell you about this... Talking to yourself, darling? Oh, Lisa, no, no, no. I was just trying to tell Clarissa about your coming today. Where is she? She just this minute went to the ladies' room. Mm-hmm. Oh, come on, Lisa. She asked us over for cocktails tomorrow. She did? I've never seen you so excited. When we ring the bell and Clarissa, the hot Clarice, opens the door and asks us in, it's going to be like the end of a bad dream for me. For me, too, but only because of you. I've never seen you so uptight before. Oh, after I meet her, I'll make it up to you. Just go back to being your old self. I promise. Oh. What, what's the matter? I, I, I don't know. I, I suddenly feel dizzy. As if I'm, I'm going to faint. Maybe we shouldn't go any further. We... We can call and make it for some other... No way. I, I'm not going to break this appointment. Let's go. Oh, Ray. What? What? Help me. I'm falling. You promised not to hurt her. The doctor's car drove into the highway a few minutes ago. We should be hearing from him any minute. There. Answer it. Answer it. I don't want him to think we've been sitting right on the phone. Now. 
Hello? Uh, Clarissa? Uh, yes, Ray. Uh, where are you? I'm home. The most incredible thing happened. We were on our way to your house, and Lisa suddenly felt faint. As a matter of fact, fainted dead away. Hit her head on a stone. Oh, I, I hope it wasn't serious. Well, the doctor says she'll be okay in a day or so, but... Well, meanwhile, we'll, we, we have to postpone our date. Oh, what a shame. I was so looking forward to meeting Lisa. Not half as much as she was. Remember? You're having tea with me. Well, that'll depend on how Lisa feels. I'm so glad Lisa's feeling better. And I'm equally glad you came over for tea. Well, would you be very upset if I drank something else? <laughs> I, I, I'm just not much of a tea lover. Well, you haven't tasted the tea I brew. I promise you, an unforgettable experience. Oh. Well, if you put it that way. Mm -hmm. I do indeed. Oh, here. Needs just a little sugar. But no cream. Looks awfully strong. Taste it. Doesn't smell like any tea I ever drank. Well, I told you, it's not like any tea you ever drank. Come on now, Ray. Take a swallow and look at me. I see you. I mean, in my eyes. Look deeply and drink deeply. Oh, Clarissa. You're... Mm. You're... Yes, Ray. What am I? Oh. You're truly beautiful. <laughs> beautiful. Oh, thank you, Ray. Your eyes have a, a radiance mm -hmm. and a and a shine that I've never seen before. And and your lips. Yes, yes, my lips. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Would you like to kiss my lips? Oh yes. Yes, I would. Oh. <laughs> This is what I wanted since we first met, Ray. To hold you in my arms and hold you forever and ever and hold your youth and your vitality and feel it make me young again. And do you still find me beautiful, Ray? Yeah. You've changed. But I can still see your beauty. Drink some more tea, Ray. And hold me. Hold me tight and close, that's it. Squeeze me, Ray, and I'll squeeze you. Squeeze the life out of you and into me. And... You're, you're not Clarissa. Of course I am. And you're Clarissa. And Lisa's Clarice. And your true love. No. No, you... You're old. You're the old lady Lisa saw. Hold me. You... Hold me, Ray. Hold me tight. No. The tighter you hold me, the more I'll seem like Clarissa. Hold me, Ray. Hold me. And love me for all eternity, because we're bound together forever. To all the newly married and about to be married listening, I know of a charming little house for sale. It's a great bargain. The only qualification that's absolutely necessary is that the husband be a young and virile man. However, if you purchase it, you don't have to worry because all of you are strong-minded enough to know that there really aren't any such things as witches. I'll be back shortly. Speaking of witches, as we were, it's of course true that people have always had an ambiguous attitude towards them. 
In some literature, they're portrayed as fascinating, lovely women with quicksilver qualities who bewitch the males with their charms. In other stories, they appear ugly old bags, spreading evil and polluting everything they touch. Which is the true picture? Could it be, perhaps, that both are true? Think about it. Our cast included Patricia Elliott, Carol Titel, Ira Lewis, and Dan Ocko. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Now, a preview of our next tale. It was more than a promise. Eddie. It was an oath. Look, Eddie. No, you look, Tom. You look back. An amount of dirt in that prison camp. In Korea. You look back and see three guys. We, three guys, were kneeling next to that mound of dirt. Because it's Hennessy's grave. Look back and hear us. Hear us swear never to rest. Never to stop. Never to know a moment's peace until we kill. Robert Joseph Myers. Eddie. How could we just kill him? How simple. Blow his brains out. You, you live in another world whether you realize it or not. Now you just... Don't go around killing people. That there are people who have to be killed, Tom. You're not in combat. The war is over. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Anheuser Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser, and the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg Special K cereal. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant. Dream. just in time to join me on another journey through that uncharted, limitless, mysterious world of your own imagination. It has been said that a man who tries to please two women satisfies neither and succeeds only in vexing himself. So many men have heard of this most prudent and profitable advice. Indeed, they acknowledge it. They agree with it. They even respect it. Why don't they follow it? Why are we stopping here, Silas? Such a lovely night. The sea is so calm. There isn't a soul in sight for miles around. Oh, yes. It's as if we own the entire world and we're all alone in it. Yes. You know, on a night like this, problems seem so far away. Oh, we have no problems. We don't. I do. Oh, what's your problem, darling? It's not what. It's who. Well, then, who is your problem? You are, my dear. Me? What kind of problem could I possibly be? A problem I must get rid of. Silas! Oh, Silas! What are you doing? No, Silas, I'll... For anything you say, please don't... No! mystery drama, Too Many Women Can Kill You, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Larry Haynes. It is sponsored in part by New Sugar-Free Diet 7-Up and Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. (laughs) 
It was Sigmund Freud, the master himself, who said, The great question, which I have not been able to answer, despite my 30 years of research into the feminine soul, is, What does a woman want? Well, such a question may have disturbed the immortal doctor, but not the man you are about to meet. His name is Silas Cunningham. And if you were to ask him, What does a woman want? Silas Cunningham would look at you in all sincerity and say, Well, every woman I've ever met has always wanted me. And it's evidently true. Because there is one woman who wants Silas forever, even after she's dead. Go in with her now, Silas. Is she uh, better, Doctor? No. But Dr. Pierce... Go see her now, while you can. Silas, is that you? Yes, darling. Oh, I, I want to carry Please, Jordan, please, save your strength. I, I have nothing to save my strength for. Listen to me. I, I'll, I'll be here. Of course you'll be here. You'll get better. I'll be here after I'm dead. Darling, I, I don't even... I'll be in this room. In this room. Our room. I love it so much. Yes, yes, darling. Oh, no, no one will see me, but you, you'll see me. Yes, dear. No one will hear me, but you'll hear me. You, you believe that, don't you? Don't you? Yes, yes, I believe it. Oh, darling, we, we love each other so much. We will not, we refuse to be parted, even even by death. Oh, hold my hand. Oh, my uh, darling, Julia. I'll, I'll come back to you, Silas. I'll never leave you. I, I'll never leave you. Julia? Julia? Doctor? Doctor Pearson? <laughs> I was afraid. Of what? I'd be stood up. Now, when did I ever break a date with you, darling? Why are you late? I didn't take the early train to town. Why not? Well, I begin each day with a visit to Julia's grave. Really, sir? Yes, I arrive each morning at nine and, and sit an hour. And do what? Meditate. Oh, you, you're such a... Fraud. Marilyn, darling, how can you say that? I suppose everyone in the village knows about it. Oh, yes, yes. The talk of the town seems to be how grief-stricken I am. <laughs> you have absolutely no more. Oh, but it's true, dear. I am grief-stricken. After the way she drove you crazy? Or was all that just talk? For my benefit? Oh, Julia was all right in her way. Mm. She made very few demands of me. If it weren't for that occult nonsense she was all wrapped up in, I, I could have even been happy. Why is it so important for you to create this appearance of the bereaved and ravaged lover? Well, when very rich wives die young, certain nasty-minded, suspicious persons may begin to formulate all sorts of uh, evil thoughts. Hmm. I understand. And so for a year or so, there should be a show of decorum. I still have the apartment. But there's no reason why we shouldn't enjoy the estate. Boating, tennis, so much to do. Darling, I want you out there. But doesn't that go again? No. No, no, because you see, I decided to write a book. Book? Yes, and I'll need an editorial assistant. <laughs> You're going to write a book? About what? About the occult, the supernatural, <laughs> the very strong possibilities of communication with the dead. Oh, but you know as well as I do that that's all nonsense. Oh, please, dear. This book is to be dedicated to the memory of my beloved wife. Silence. Now, you have had considerable experience in the publishing field. You were Julia's very best friend. And besides, as far as uh, outward appearances go, we shall be impeccably chaperoned. By whom? By the redoubtable Mrs. Watson herself. I shall ask her to stay on as housekeeper. Mrs. Watson. Mm hmm Madam Hatchetface. My darling, she radiates respectability from every poor. 
When do I report for duty? Saturday. Call when you're ready. I'll have Hastings drive into town and pick you up. Well, here's to the book. And, uh, to other things. Mr. Cunningham, I brought you some nice hot tea. Oh, come now. You must have something. Oh, look, I know how you feel. Everyone knew. It was a, a real love match, you and that wonderful lady, rest her soul. But would Julia Cunningham want you to despair like this? Thank you, Mrs. Watson. What would I do without you? Good evening, Silas. Oh, Dr. Pearson. Um, you want to fetch me a cup of that tea, Miss Watson? Yes, Doctor. Thank you. Mrs. Watson says you don't eat. Thought I'd stop by to see if you're all right. Oh, I'm fine. I'm worried about you. Me? Your marriage was something special, Silas. Well, every marriage is special. You and Julia. No two people ever seem to be more close, more content, more in love. She was everything to me, Doctor. Everything. In a marriage like yours, when one partner goes, well, sometimes the other one loses all interest in life. Now, don't let it happen to you, Silas. Well, I don't care much about anything right now, Doctor. Well, get hold of yourself. Don't let your mind wander. Don't shut yourself away. Life must go on. And it can be quite a life for you. She came into all her money last year. You know, I'd give every penny to bring her back. Yeah, you would. That's what worries me. What are you saying, Doctor? Uh, Julia was very much taken with the idea of being able to communicate with the dead. It was a very sincere belief. I'm sure you discussed it. Even decided that in the event one of you died, there'd be an attempt at communication uh, from beyond the grave. Doctor, this is a very personal and private matter between Julia and me. I notice you say is instead of was. I'd rather we don't discuss it. In those final feverish moments, she talked about it. She said... I know what she said. She said her spirit would always be in her room. Doctor, why do you insist because on... Because it's hokum. Sane, sensible people know these things simply can't happen, period. Well, don't you worry about it. I worry because in this world there are all sorts of unscrupulous confidence operators who prey upon vulnerable people, people like you. Well, I can take care of myself. Your tray, Dr. Pearson. Oh. Well, one thing's in your favor. Mrs. Watson's staying on, and she's the most level-headed person I know. Mrs. Watson... Can I depend on you to keep Mr. Cunningham here out of trouble? Yes, Doctor. You can depend on it. And you can depend on me. Uh, Mr. Cunningham... Uh... Shh, shh. I've got a beat on him now. Oh, darn, I missed him again. Oh, well... It's too nice a day to hit anything anyhow. I just feel like making some noise in the woods. Mr. Cunningham... What is it, Hastings? Well, I don't know. I, I gotta talk to you. I mean, I, I don't know what... Now, why don't what... you start at the beginning, Hastings? Yes, sir. Uh, look, you know what's just happened to me, Mr. Cunningham? No. What happened? Well, I've been fired. Fired? Well, how could you be fired? Well, that's what I can't figure. Well, who in the world could have fired you, Hastings? Oh, Lady Iron Pants. I mean, Mrs. Watson. Oh, boy. Well, I don't know. She comes up to me and she says, Hastings, you're finished. Here's your money. Get out of here. Just like that. Well, I don't understand why. Well, she figures with Mrs. Cunningham passed away, she can rule the roost. You know what I mean? She's always had it in for me anyhow. Why, Hastings? Well, I guess I'd... Pop off about her. Pop off? How? Well, I was only kidding, but it, it was about, uh, about sex. <laughs> sex? Oh, come on now, Hastings. Why would anyone talk that way with Mrs. Watson? Why, she must be at least, uh, well, at least, uh... Yeah? Uh, how old do you think she is? Well, late 50s, even 60 may be over. Uh, next time, take a good look. She ain't even 40 yet. And she's been a widow... Eighteen years. 
Well, I'm sure we can adjust the matter. Well, I, I told her to go soak her head. I told her Mr. Cunningham hired me. Therefore, only Mr. Cunningham can fire me. Uh, is that right? Yes, Hastings. That's right. Now, you go back to the garage. You'll have to go to the city this afternoon. <laughs> If I'm to perform my duties in a satisfactory manner, I must have the right to hire and fire, Mr. Cunningham. Yes, yes, of course, Mrs. Watson. It's just that Hastings has been with us for such a long time. I dismissed him for good cause. He's a thief. A thief? I found out. He's been getting together with some of the service places in town. We've been paying bills for repairs that were never made, for gasoline that we never bought. Oh? Are you sure? I'm positive. The sooner he's off the premises, the better for all concerned. Well, it's just that I, uh... I would want him to drive into the city this afternoon. Oh, yes. Yes, I'm expecting a call from Mar... From, uh, uh, Mrs. Ralston. Marilyn Ralston, of course. Uh, she called while you were out shooting. Oh? Did she say what time she wants to be picked up? If we fire Hastings, I'll drive in myself. Oh, that won't be necessary, Mr. Cunningham. What do you mean? She isn't coming out this afternoon. Oh, Something the matter? Or any afternoon, for that matter. Well, why? Did she suddenly change her mind? No. But I told her that you had changed yours. What are you talking about, Mrs. Watson? I never told you I changed it mine. It wasn't necessary for you to tell me, sir. I acted in your best interests. Mrs. Watson, I'm very capable of determining my best interests. And furthermore... Yes, Mr. Cunningham? What are you staring at? That, uh... That bracelet. Yes, this bracelet. Well, how dare you, Mrs. Watson? That was my wife's bracelet. I know. Well, what right do you have she to wear... She told me I could have it. She whispered it to me. Well, that's a lie. The day she died. It isn't true. The day she died of, uh... Oh, what did the good Dr. Pearson say? An infection? <laughs> Nobody questioned dear Dr. Pearson's diagnosis... How fortunate he signed the death certificate without questioning it himself. Now, you couldn't prove oh, anything. Of course not. I couldn't prove anything, but... Now, if they were to exhume the body and uh, perform certain tests... Oh, but they would never do it. Unless someone suggested it strongly. And uh, as of right now, I don't plan to suggest it. <laughs> Well, there you are. You get what you consider to be the perfect setup for the perfect murder. You get rid of a woman who is a thorn in your side, only to discover you've just acquired one who could be a rope around your neck. The rope either gets tightened or loosened when I return shortly with Act Two. The WBBM News Time, 1053. Temperature in Chicago, 82 degrees. On her deathbed, Julia Cunningham promised her husband Silas she would communicate with him from the other world. However, it now develops that Silas may have more trouble than he can handle in this world. It seems that Mrs. Watson, the faithful housekeeper, has discovered that Silas had actually hastened Julia's exit from what is sometimes described as this veil of tears. Mrs. Watson, what makes you think I would have something to fear from an autopsy? Isn't it obvious? Isn't what obvious? Oh, the situation we find ourselves in. Now, if you didn't fear an autopsy, this bracelet would be off my arm, you'd fire me on the spot, and I would be out on my ear. Now, I know... Just what do you know? I know I was right about the bottle of poison. What bottle of poison? Oh, come, sir. It was in your room. I made a few discreet inquiries. I learned from a doctor that small, steady doses could produce symptoms which might appear to indicate an intestinal infection, and it would be treated as such until suddenly the patient would die. <laughs> Incidentally, that doctor was not Dr. Pearson. And, uh, just how would I be implicated? Well, if, if I were to voice my suspicions strenuously enough, and if the coroner should find poison... Oh. 
I see. Uh, Isn't it your duty as a reputable citizen to uh, report this? Yes, it is. Why haven't you done so? Well, I could set in motion a chain of events that could place you on a scaffold or in a prison for life. And I asked myself, now, what would be in all this for me? Well, the satisfaction that you had performed your duty as a responsible citizen of a democracy. Oh, I've been doing that all my life, and I have very little to show for it. And so I said to myself, Vera, I'll wager you didn't know my first name was Vera. Well, to be honest, I didn't even know you had a first name. That's true. To you, I've always been the invisible Mrs. Watson. And so, for the first time in my life, I did something different, unusual, unprecedented. And what was that? For once, I thought about me, my own welfare. You see, Mr. Cunningham, you had committed the perfect crime. Well, how? You seem to have detected it. Oh, the key element... Dr. Pearson. Old, fumbling, superannuated Dr. Pearson. Well, he's not all that incompetent. Oh, no. He's merely obsolete. And you counted on that. You counted on him accepting your wife's death as a purely natural event and getting a death certificate without an autopsy. Uh -huh. Well, Mrs. Watson, now what? I assume you intend to blackmail me. Well, that's a harsh word. How much money do you want? Oh, I don't want any money. You don't want any money? No. Well, then what do you want? I want you. You want me? Yes. Uh, what does that mean? <laughs> what do you think it means? I want to be Mrs. Silas Cunningham. Would you mind saying that again? I think you heard it. Yes, I heard it. I can't believe it. <laughs> You know, people like you are completely unaware of people like me. As human beings, our mission in life is to serve, to be useful, to cater to all your creature concerns. But I have feelings. I have desires, emotions, yearnings. Well, I... Uh... I'm only three years older than you are. That's young enough. There's still time enough for me to enjoy a rich, exciting life. <laughs> I've heard of shotgun weddings, but... Why I... turn you over to the police? I have a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Finally, Vera Watson, you two can become somebody. Nobody's maid, nobody's servant. Cross the line. You know, I, uh... I wish I could say I admire you. Oh, well, we'll, uh... We'll let a year go by, a decent interval, and then we'll announce our engagement. I can assure you, Mrs. Watson, you're hardly my type. Uh, perhaps. But you're mine. And after a while, I'll become yours. You think so? Oh, you'll come to value me when you know me better. Oh, by the way... Yes? Unlike so many women in love, Mr. Cunningham, I'm not blind. Uh, for example, I see how you've been glancing at your shotgun. Oh, have I been doing that? Well, I, uh... I wouldn't recommend anything hasty, sir. You see, I've written a letter to my sister. It's to be opened in the event of my death. Need I say more? No. I think you've said quite enough. <laughs> Must have been dreaming. Simon? Simon? Who? Who is that? Simon! Julia! I said I'd come back to our room. Julia! Simon! Darling! Why did you kill me? Julia! Julia, I didn't! My darling! You mustn't lie to me! But, Julia! I've come from such a long way! Don't lie to me! Julia, please! Why did you kill me? Julia, I, I didn't... Silas. Oh, Silas, it was for nothing. Julia, I, I didn't mean to. I must have been crazy. It was for nothing. Will you be better off with her? Will you kill her, too? Julia, Julia, please, will you listen to me? Will you kill her? Julia, I didn't know. I didn't know what I was doing. Silas, you'll have no rest. 
no peace until you kill her, too. Julia, please. Julia. Mr. Cunningham. I didn't mean to kill you, Julia. Be quiet. I didn't mean it, Julia. I How... didn't... Shut, Shut up, up, sir. What are... what are you doing in here? What did you slap me for? It's a good thing none of the servants sleep on this side of the house. You were having a nightmare. Oh, no, no. She was here. Julia was here. I saw her. I heard her. Ah, oh, snap out of it. You don't understand. Can't you understand? You were screaming that you murdered her. All you need, all we need is for someone to hear that. But it was so real. Oh, look, you've got to get hold of yourself. Because if you don't, we're going to have a problem. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. You're right. Oh. Well, at least you, you're beginning to see how much you need a woman like me. You must keep your sanity. And I can help you do it. Now, listen. No, please. not now. Now, you take this sleeping pill and get yourself some rest. Doctor, I'm fine. I'm just fine. But you don't go anywhere. You don't do anything. Well, I don't care to. Silas, you've lost your color. You look thinner. You've got to develop an interest in life once again. I'll be all right. Silas, you're not getting all twisted up in that occult business, are you? You're not getting visits, I hope. Doctor, I loved my wife very much. And I still haven't recovered from the shock of having lost her. And I wish that everyone would let me alone. All right, Silas. I'll leave you some vitamins. Oh, Mr. Cunningham. Oh, good morning, Dr. Pearson. Good morning, Miss Watson. Our friend here looks a bit peaked. Hasn't been eating much, I bet. No, but I'm on my way to town to buy some things to tempt his appetite. I'll give you a lift. Oh, thank you. I just have to stop by the kitchen to leave some instructions. I'll see you outside in a couple of minutes. Hmm. You know, Silas, something's different about that woman. Different? No. In what way? Well, for one thing, she looks much younger. For another, she's not too bad looking. I hadn't noticed. Something's come over her. Now, what do you suppose it could be? I haven't the faintest idea. Hello? Hello. Is Mrs. Watson there, please? Uh, no, I'm sorry. She's out. Oh. Well, uh, will she be back soon? Well, it's hard to say. She's downtown shopping. Oh, uh, could you take a message for her? Yes. I'm her sister. Her sister, Emma. It's, uh, it's about the letter. The letter? Mm. A couple of weeks ago, she gave me a letter. And she said, uh, I was to open it only in case she, uh... Well, she'll know which letter I mean. Uh, yes. Well, um, uh, tell her the letter's gone. Oh? I, uh, put it in a wooden box with some of my things and, uh... We had a fire in the house, and everything's been destroyed. Oh, I see. So, uh, I don't have the letter anymore. And if it was very important, I... Well, she'd better send me another one. Would you tell her that? Uh, yes, certainly. Thank you. Don't mention that. Good evening, Mrs. Watson. Oh, good evening, Mr. Cunningham. Is this how you spend your evenings, Mrs. Watson? Knitting? Knitting, reading, listening to music. Well, I've often wondered what you did with your time. Oh, that's not true. I don't imagine you ever gave me a second thought. Well, for better or worse. <laughs> do you know what I uh, like to do on a lovely night like this? No. Go out in the boat. Well, why don't you? Well, I uh, never cared to go out alone. Are you asking me to go with you? Mm-hmm. Why? Well, it's uh, part of my courtship, Mrs. Watson. <laughs> you are a remarkable man, Mr. Cunningham. And you are a remarkable woman. <laughs> you know, actually, you were right the other night. You're the woman I need. The woman who can hold me in balance. Vera. Vera? Yes, Vera. You know, I have the feeling that I'm... Uh, Falling in love with you, Vera. Mr. Cunning. My name is Silas. Uh, Silas. Vera, I need you. I need your strength and your good sense. Well, we... We'll be very good for each other. You'll see. Oh, yes. 
Yes, you'll supply the common sense and I'll supply the romance. Now, how about that boat ride? <laughs> I'm very happy. Oh, Silas, life is so unpredictable, isn't it? Yes, that's the one thing you can say for sure. A month ago, who would believe it? You and I would be drifting along out here, close together. You know, it's getting a bit late. Oh, do we have to go back in now? Well, we, uh, we better. The breeze is freshening. We may be in for a gale. You wouldn't want to be blown out to sea, would you? Oh, no. Well, we, uh, we must do this more often. Yes. Tell me, where are we headed? I I mean, we're not going toward shore. That's right. But you said... What did I say? Well, that it was time to go home. I'm going home. Silas, what what am I saying? What I'm saying is there's no one within miles, and this should be far enough. Far enough for what? Well, you see, you took the boat out tonight all by yourself. And I guess you fell overboard. Silence! And here you go. Oh, no, 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 you must have forgotten my letters to my sister. Don't, don't! Silence! I can't sleep! Yes, I know. I can't help! Silence! Oh, uh, I forgot to tell you. You had a phone call from your sister. Help! I can't sleep! Please, speak gently of her. She's gone. You see, she had an accident last week. She went out in the boat. And she drowned. It was a terrible thing. But why did you instruct her to tell me to forget all about you? Darling, I can explain everything. Well, it had better be a fantastic explanation. Still want to see me? Well, I shouldn't. But? How long will it take you to get here? Give me an hour. Sure thing. Well. What? Looks as if that poor girl's going to get stood up again. Well, who are, who are you? Wouldn't be a good idea for the two of you to be seen together. Well, wait just one minute. What are you doing here? Who are you? How do you do, sir? I'm your new housekeeper. Now, see here. Let's cut this nonsense. I'm your new housekeeper for a very good reason. My name is Emma. Emma? You remember? Emma? Vera Watson's sister? Oh. Oh. And the reason I'm your new housekeeper is because I found the letter. First, Julia cramped his style. Goodbye, Julia. Then, Vera Watson had him cornered. Goodbye, Vera. Now, here comes Emma. It never rains, it pours. What are we going to do about Emma? This will be the exclusive business of Act Three when I return shortly. This is WBBM Chicago News Radio 78. How does Silas Cunningham keep track of all his women? They all fall madly in love with him, they all want him. How does he manage them? Well, some of them are have accidents. For example, his wife died of a stomach ache. His housekeeper drowned. It seems she went out in the boat by herself and fell overboard. Or anyhow, that's what the sheriff thinks. Now, the latest woman who has entered his life is Emma. That's right. Emma. Yes, I, uh, spoke to you on the telephone. That's right. And I told you about the letter. Uh Uh-huh. What are you doing here? I didn't think there was anything to that letter. Well, there isn't. Oh, Silas. Silas. When I read that my poor sister... Well, actually, she's my stepsister. A drowned. Well, you know, she shouldn't have gone out in that boat alone. Oh, she didn't go out in the boat alone, Silas. You went out in the boat with her. What did you do? Throw her overboard? Now, you can't prove that. I don't have to prove that. I still know about the other thing. All right, let's get this over with, huh? 
How much do you want? Oh, you don't catch on at all, Silas. What do you mean? I think you're kind of cute. Oh. Good. You know, you're obviously an intelligent woman. Why, uh, why don't we make a settlement? What did you have in mind? Well, uh... Before you tell me, let me tell you what I had in mind. I can marry you. Then sue you for divorce and strip you clean. You know, you drive a hard bargain. <laughs> You'd have been better off with Vera. I'd have been better off with Julia. <laughs> Yes. Ye- yes? Silas, huh? I'm here. Oh, no, no, go away, go away. It's Julia, darling. What? It's me, Julia. What? Julia, please, what do you want of me? What do you want? Silas, darling. What do you want? I'm keeping our promise. <sighs> we will not be parted by death. I, I killed you. It doesn't matter. Oh, Julia, Julia. Poor foolish Silas. Oh, Julia. Love. so stupid. I don't know what happened to me. It just keeps getting worse and worse for me. I know. You had to kill poor Mrs. Watson. Yes, and now I'll have to kill this this horrible woman, Miss Emma. Yes. You must kill her before she destroys you. But, but how? How can I kill her, Julia? How? It, darling, it's so simple. Think. How? Think. Tell me. Tell me, Julia. Please tell me. Poison. Hide the bottle in her room and take a little bit yourself every day, just as you did with me. But, Julia, you died. But you stop in time. Call the doctor, complain, tell him you think you're being poisoned. They'll discover the bottle in her room. Now, Julia, Julia, please, they'll think she was trying to poison me. Yes, darling. You see how simple it is? Well, why would she want to poison me? Why did Mrs. Watson want to poison me? Mrs. Watson? Of course. It was Mrs. Watson. Don't you see? Emma was finishing the job. Her sister started. I'm dead. Now they find poison in your system. The bottle in her room. Oh, Julia, Julia, please. My darling, Julia... Please, my beloved Julia. Julia. What's going on in here? Julia. Hey, snap out of it. You're having a bad dream. Uh, No. No, no. That was not a dream. Okay, have it your way. Uh, Don't you humor me. I saw she was right here. Oh, sure. She's keeping her promise. Her promise? Yes, she said she'd come back, and she told me how how I could... How I could... (laughs) She told me. It's wonderful. Oh, this is terrific. (laughs) Keep it up. Keep what up? Oh, what you're doing now? Huh? And after we get married, I can have you put away in the nut house. No, 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 no. She was right here. You can laugh all you like, but she was here. Oh, sure she was. And she was wearing a white dress with blue shoes and a green hat. And there were little men seven inches tall with heads like pancakes. Shut up. What? And get out of here. Don't you dare insult the memory of my wife. Well, you better be careful how you talk to me, Silas. Why? You know what I can do. Yes, but that's all you can do. All? I can put you on a scaffold. You do that. And you won't get one single cent. (laughs) You're bluffing. Am I? Call it. Silas, honey. We're stuck with each other. Why not make the best of it? Hmm? We may be stuck, my dear. But not for long. Good morning, Silas. Good morning. I hope you feel better today. I don't. Breakfast? No, just coffee. You haven't hardly eaten a thing for the last three days. You got me worried. Worried? Yeah, you're my meal ticket. I don't want anything to go wrong with you. <laughs> Besides, as I said the first day I met you, you're cute. I don't uh, think I'll have any more coffee either. What's the matter? Nothing, nothing. But it has to be something. Oh, well, I... Uh... I have these pains. What kind of pains? I don't know. Uh, Just pains. Where? Everywhere. 
Well, you want me to call the doctor? No. No, not yet. Not yet? Uh, what are you waiting for? I'm waiting for just exactly the right time. What do you mean by just exactly the right time? There's an exactly right time for everything. Now, I better go upstairs and lie down. Can you manage? No, I can manage. I can manage everything. Dr. Pearson? Doctor, this is Emma, Mr. Cunningham's housekeeper. Uh, what is it, Emma? Dr. Pearson, Mr. Cunningham's been sick the past four or five days. Sick? What do you mean? Well, he can't eat. He has pains. Looks kind of feverish to me. Well, why didn't he call me? I said to him, call the doctor. But he said he wanted to wait. Wait for what? Well, he said he... Wanted to wait for just exactly the right time. I'll be right there. Oh, Julia. Julia, why does it hurt so much now? This is only the fourth day I've been taking the poison. You needed ten. Oh, is it supposed to be this bad? Julia, please... Please come here and talk to me. I, I'm going to call Dr. Pearson now. I better not wait any longer. Oh, I better call. Uh, maybe my system is different. I only took a little bit. Julia, please. Where are you? I'm here, oh. Brandon. Here. Is, is this how it was with you? Yes, darling. I can't stand it. Neither oh. could I. That's why. That's why I let go. Let go? Yes, darling. Let go. I can't take it anymore. I know. Oh, oh don't keep fighting it. But I have to hold out until Pearson gets here. He can't save you, darling. No one. Nothing can save you now. Oh, Julia, Julia. I... Oh, come with me, darling. Where? It won't hurt you anymore. Oh. Here. Uh, Hold my hand. Yeah. Now, uh, come. Uh, sit up. Uh, I don't have the strength. You do. No. See? Uh, and now, uh, walk. Oh. Walk with me. Oh, Julia, I can't stand the pain. Oh, just uh, a few more steps, darling. Uh, a few more uh, steps. Uh, then Silas, get away from that window, you fool! No, let go, darling. You can let go. Oh, Julia, Julia! Silas! Well, Emma, it's obvious. What killed him was a skull fracture. He fell out of the window and hit his head on a rock. Poor Silas. What was he doing near the window, Emma? I don't know. Well, did he say anything? He just called Julia. Julia? Mm. Yes. Well, he simply never got over her death. I suppose he couldn't accept it. Julia. It was as if he could see her. Well, maybe it's for the best. There was really no living for him without her. You know that. Yes, Doctor. Never knew him even to look at another woman. Is that right, Doctor? A very unusual man. That's true, Doctor. He's the kind of exceptional person you meet so rarely in this world. All of us will be the poorer for his loss. You can say that again, Doctor. All of us will be the poorer. <laughs> you know what they say, de mortuis nil nisi bonum, which means only speak nice things about the dead. And after all, Silas Cunningham paid the price. Ironic, isn't it? So many men envied him his fantastic good looks and his successful way with women. It shows you can have too much of a good thing, but you cannot have too much of mystery theater. I'll be back shortly. It 
It's all perspective. To Dr. Pearson, Silas Cunningham was almost a saint. To Marilyn, he was a lovable rogue. To his wife, Julia, he was a sincere, devoted lover. To Vera, he was a killer. To Emma, he was a fool. Each of us is a combination of so many people. Have you ever tried to figure out your combination? It may unlock some hidden facets in your personality. On the Mystery Theater, we deal in hidden facets all the time. Try us again. Our cast included Larry Haynes, E.V. Juster, Bryna Rayburn, and Guy Sorrell. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Now, a preview of our next tale. What happened? Steve, you're... uh, You're alive. Uh, Yeah, I guess so. How are you? Hey, you're bleeding. Huh? Oh, I just... I, I just cut my head a little. It's it's nothing. Ah! Uh, oh, I can't get up. I think I sprained my ankle. Maybe broken it. Here, give me a hand, Si. Uh, some sort of jagged rock under my back. Uh, c- could you move it or, 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 or help me up? Yeah, let, let me see. Yeah. Oh, it's just... It's just a rock. Let me get rid of it and then... Rid of it or use it. What are you waiting for? I, uh, I'm not waiting any longer. Well, then, for the love of. (laughs) This time, you are dead. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Anheuser Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.